Good morning, Commissioner. At Rothstein, it is January something. January, I think, 19th. 19th. Wow, 19th. January 19th. And it is 8 o'clock in the morning. And as we always do, let's stand for a Pledge of Allegiance and moment of silence. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, at this time, what I need is a motion to go into close for legal. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I got a motion. Is there a second? Second. I got a motion to second. Any discussion seen here? None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Second. Okay. Again, Commissioner Ed Rothstein, I need at this time a motion to adjourn. Closed legal. From closed legal. Motion to adjourn, closed legal. Second. Second. Okay, I got a motion, I got a couple of seconds. Any discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And now I need a motion to go into recess until 10. Motion to recess till 10 o'clock. Second. I got a motion, second. Any discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Thank you. I just test if you can count backwards. <laughs> okay. I need that test. <laughs> Commissioner Ed Rothstein, it is Thursday, January 19th. Although we had a, a series of opening and then closing for legal and uh, getting into administrative, and we started with the pledge already at 8, I don't think you could say it too often. So if we can, uh, start again with the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence, please. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice, for all. Okay. <clears throat> and I have a, a gut feeling of why I see as many as I do in front of us and maybe even some on the phone will will check it out uh, we have a relatively full agenda um, let's start off with as we always do priority Carol and see maybe uh, try to abbreviate it best we can in moving forward so Commissioner uh, Vigliotti, what's on your mind? Well, uh, very, very briefly, I uh, over the course of the last week, I attended the viewing of uh, previous councilman Carl Ebaugh from Tawnytown. I presented the letter that we had written for his family. Uh, they were extremely appreciative and grateful for that, and they were also grateful that we took the time to, to, to do that. Uh, additionally, I attended the Farm Bureau Legislative Dinner the other night. Uh, it was a wonderful time. Our hosts were incredibly gracious, learned a lot, and I am looking forward to working with them over the next several years. And uh, that's all for me this morning. Fantastic. Commissioner Kyler from District uh, 2. Yeah, and I'll be real quick also. I also attended the Farm Bureau dinner. That was great. It's great to see um, the ag people of the county and uh, hear their opinions on a number of things. Um, I visited the, the ARC um, of Carroll County, and that was awesome, and I learned a lot. And I'm going to keep visiting, and uh, some people um, criticized me. I was going to say yelled at me. During the state <laughs> of the county, I gave out my cell phone number and my email address. That's genuine. Call it, and so be it. They're like, why did you do that? And I said, why wouldn't I? You know, my philosophy is... Um, what I do, I do. I'm not going to tell any of you. You need to do it, but um, it was very intentional. So please call. Absolutely. And I like that being deliberate because I've done the same. So appreciate that a lot. Commissioner Gordon, District 3. Thank you. Uh, so first off, uh, this past Saturday, I attended the uh, VFW Post 467's Voice of Democracy, Patriots Pen, and Teachers of the Year Awards. Uh, all the applicants were very well deserving and I believe our youth showed a, a great appreciation for our military and veterans. Um, as several of my other commissioners and I all attended the uh, Farm Bureau dinner the other evening. Uh, yesterday I was in Annapolis uh, attending the inauguration of Governor Westmore and Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller. Very well attended event and I uh, had several very positive conversations with some folks regarding Carroll County so I hope to see some positive outcomes there. Um, also, fun historical fact for today, it's uh, happy birthday, Carroll County. Uh, we were formed January 19th of 1837. So the uh, document you see on the screen here, this document was is a copy of what was originally printed when the formation of Carroll County was completed. Uh, it illustrates the map of Carroll, which formed hundreds, which are laying plats from Baltimore and Frederick County. The two counties at the time comprised about a fifth of the territorial area of Maryland. Uh, Carroll was named after the signer of the Declaration of Independence, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. It was estimated at the time that Carroll would contain roughly 20,000 residents. Uh, we've obviously made a uh, large leap since then. Uh, Westminster, which is centrally located in the new county, proposed county, was contained roughly 700 people at the time and was designated to be the county seat. Uh, the map presented at the top of the document here gives a true picture of the boundaries of Carroll. During the early proposals, uh, numerous towns were against the concept of uh, Westminster being the county seat, one being Manchester. Uh, in a first vote of the formation, it was heavily against that idea of even having Carroll as a county. Uh, when it was formed, though, the, uh, many felt that there was too much power to be held centrally in the uh, Westminster area. So uh, 
a number of them wanted to stay in Baltimore and Frederick County versus becoming part of this new uh, proposed county. Uh, a number of residents in Manchester opted to turn the town cannon and fired it in the direction of Westminster as a gesture against the proposed county. Uh, the committee noted from the document work to have it presented to future citizens of Carroll County and no doubt those citizens helped envision the county we have today. Uh, the example shown on screen here by Chris is the only known printed copy of this document that it, we know that exists. Obviously, there's a handwritten example, but uh, we believe possibly that one might have been given to all the uh, signers at the time, but currently this one is the only one known to exist. Thank you. Fantastic. I think uh, Commissioner Kyler and former Commissioner Weaver were there, you know, for their first birthday blowing out the candles, but just saying. So where is Stella today? Do we know? I know she was at, was it? Uh, there's Stella. There's Stella. There's Stella. I always wonder where Stella is. So Stella being the mascot and staple of the Boys and Girls Club up here in Carroll County. And I know Commissioner Gordon's very proud of Stella. Um, I think you could ride Stella, but okay. Commissioner Guerin, District 4, what's on your mind? Good morning, everybody. Uh, just for the record, I, I am giving people your phone number. <laughs> You're getting a lot of phone calls. Just Thank be clear you. about that. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I, I, too, attended the Farm Bureau uh, dinner the other uh, evening. It was fantastic and extremely informative. The lobbyist was there, spoke uh, very uh, detailed about some of the bills that are in Annapolis, some of the past history as well. Uh, so I, I want to thank the Farm Bureau for, for their time. And, and you know, I reiterated, and I think we all did when we were there that evening, that we want to hear from people. I mean, we hear from residents, and we want to hear from residents more. Uh, but business people, uh, people in the farm industry, people in agriculture, you're in business too. We need to hear from you. Uh, so uh, send those emails. Uh, they can be about anything you'd like, but we, we'd like to hear back from you uh, regarding some of the other things we might be able to do uh, better here as a county for you. Uh, business, ag business, farmland, it's so important to this county. So that's it. Thank you. I, I have a Stella update. <laughs> okay. Stella's actually at the maintenance center visiting roads operations today. Hopefully she took her license. I was going to say, is she <laughs> operating the, the vehicles? I, I don't know. Maybe she's I'd be getting her CDL or something. She could be a crane herself. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Gordon mentioning uh, our governor. Uh, congratulations to our governor, Moore. Um, Lieutenant Governor Miller and the entire administration that should begin sworn in. Uh, more importantly is his acceptance of the budget on Friday uh, is what I'm looking forward to and maintaining what's in the budget stays in the budget because um, part of that's uh, the veterans home uh, funding. So uh, there's no expectation why it wouldn't. Um, Commissioner Kyler and I participate every week um, on what's called MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties, legislative uh, briefings or discussions. I am on the board of uh, MACO itself, but uh, the two of us have the opportunity to participate in subcommittees, Commissioner Kyler soon to be on the education subcommittee, and myself being on taxes. Um, there's four initiatives that the Association of Counties is taking on. The um, centralized resources for body-worn cameras for our police force, our sheriff's department. We're ahead of the game uh, because of the leadership from uh, Sheriff DeWeese and his team coming to us uh, previously in getting that uh, uh, those cameras uh, in place. It's not just the cameras, it's a tooth to tail. The teeth are the cameras, the tail is the analysis and the workforce that uh, needs to look at the footage, the databases, it is a, a very large uh, tail um, associated with the teeth of those cameras. Transparency in education spending is a second uh, initiative that we're focused on. The adult use of cannabis, whether we voted for it or not is regardless. It did pass, uh, you know, this last um, election and now it's how do we deal with it and that's our third the fourth is um, fire recruitment and retention which is very important to us uh, here in Carroll County as we established our fire uh, professional 
fire department um, through legislation in 2018. So um, figuring out the best tools and mechanisms to recruit and retain uh, our fire department. Those are the four initiatives that MAKO has taken on. There's a lot of issues, and we're going to hear from Mr. Fowler, who is our legislative liaison, in just a minute of what's happening down in, uh, I don't know if it's called Tinseltown or whatever we call Annapolis, but we call it a lot of things. Um, the last thing I just want to share is <clears throat> the town hall. I did not attend the Farm Bureau uh, dinner um, because I had a couple of town halls, and yeah, although it makes me look like a fat duck, but that's okay. Um, the uh, ev uh, morning and evening town halls were so important. Both of them had a uh, hundred folks in each, um, and just so appreciative of everyone's input into it. And uh, like Commissioner Guerin said, your voice matters. And you're gonna see, I think, some of that um, later on this morning of the importance of that. Um, but it's, it's an ongoing issue, and we're going to continue to uh, figure out how to um, continue to communicate, um, to, as I say, listen, learn, and lead. And if uh, learning means to making appropriate changes, then we make appropriate changes. If learning means to delaying decisions, then we delay decisions till we get it right. Um, yeah, I think I was asking Sheriff DeWeese about his coffee or something, but okay, enough of those things. Uh, but the town halls, I try to do quarterly and, and the newsletters. So really appreciate the participation of everyone that was uh, attending those town halls. With that said, uh, Mike, why don't you come on up to the center and <clears throat> not, uh, not too lengthy of, no. uh, of, of uh, time spent because we're only one week into this now for others. In April, it may be, you know, 10 times the size of what we're going to see, right? We could even talk for two hours now. We don't want matter, to talk for so two hours now. No, but no we certainly what don't. What do you want to share with us? Yeah, so just, just some level setting. So I'm going to serve as your eyes and ears in Annapolis and bring back to you what the, the hot issues are. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Rothstein, you have the benefit with Commissioner Kyler of sitting on the Legislative Committee and um, helping formulate uh, make those positions on bills so you're going to get a lot of intel uh, probably in advance um, but again just some level setting uh, where it actually one of my favorite quotes I always think about this time of year is no man's life liberty or property are safe when the legislature is in session <laughs> and so keep that in mind as we move forward um, we're counting down the days we got 81 days left until <laughs> signy die we'll be counting those down each week um, just some important dates. Of course, you mentioned uh, Friday the governor's budget is due. Um, that's also the date by which DLS will guarantee that your bill will get drafted. Uh, also, crossover on March 20th, very important date. And that's when bills have to, have to be passed in a chamber and move to the other chamber. And uh, then April 3rd, the budget bill needs to be passed by the legislature. And then, of course, April 10th will be, will be finished. Um, the, the Democrats have increased their numbers in both chambers. They began with, before the election, they began with veto-proof majorities. They've increased those. Um, there are 47, I believe, freshmen here. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting session. It could go two ways. Uh, people could come in and sort of sit back. The new people could come in, sit back, observe, understand what, what their role is and, and how they might get things done or they could come in with their hair on fire and just drop bill after bill. So we'll have to see. Typically, we get anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 bills each year. Um, the Senate, House and Senate hearings will be hybrid this year. They couldn't stand up their technology last year to do this, but they will have testimony both in person and virtually. Uh, so we'll have to see how, how that goes. But I think that the in-person is uh, for the people that spend a lot of time in Annapolis anyway, that's the preferable way to go. And then in addition, uh, the Rural County Coalition is a collection of 16 of the rural counties of which Carroll is one. Uh, we uh, conduct a Zoom call each Monday night to sort of preview the bills that are gonna come before the Legislative Committee on Wednesday. So it's an opportunity for 
uh, for you, uh, either of you, to participate in that and uh, to make sure that the rural county perspective is brought to the larger MAKO discussions on Wednesday. Uh, you went over the MAKO initiative, so I'll, I'll pass on that. Um, we'll jump into the bills. I've tried to organize these in, in some meaningful way, and I'll be bringing bills that have an impact to Carroll County, either to the budget or to our operations, which then obviously funnel up to the budget. So um, the, the first is business and taxes, HR and procurement. Uh, first of all, just a point um, that there are any number of, of income tax subtraction modification bills that come through, all for very worthy causes. Typically, you'll find them, and, and they're income tax exemptions, fire and police, um, military, any, any number. The, the problem there is a subtraction modification will affect local revenue as well. And the stance of MAKO is to oppose those bills in principle, not the subject, not the worthy subjects, but the, the way in which it's done, that MAKO believes they should be done as tax credits, which will affect state, the state budget, but will not affect local budgets. So we won't talk about those individually, but just know when you hear subtraction modification, the stance of the counties is that we prefer those to be tax credits. One of the big issues this year will be an acceleration of the minimum wage that was, uh, that was done last year, and the governor is, has uh, said that he wants to do that as well. So there is a bill in that will accelerate it. Um, there may be another bill coming that will, will be different, so we won't spend a lot of time on this until we see that next bill. Uh, Senate Bill 114, the constant yield tax rate and property tax. Uh, you have to report that each year, and it's very confusing to the public. It's very conf actually very few people understand uh, the way it's written. So this bill will attempt to simplify that language. So when you put that notification out, people will understand. Uh, Senate Bill 122, property tax exemption for religious groups, organizations. So right now, if a, a relig religious organization, a church, has uh, a tax exemption for its property if it leases all or part of that property to a third party the tax exemption would not apply either and if it's a portion of the property then it wouldn't apply to that portion of property uh, under environment uh, house bill 11 private well safety act of 23 this passed last year in the house but did not make it through the senate establishes a grant program the county can be considered a um, an eligible county you would need to uh, put an outreach effort together and then you would be able to to help residents there's a, a uh, there's an income requirement in there but it would make uh available grants to residents for inspections of wells and remediation for uh, any contaminants. Another bill, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds because I think first you probably need a briefing on what the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal is, Authority is and, and how uh, it supports Carroll County. But just know that there is a bill in that will revoke the bonding authority of the authority uh, starting June 1st of this year and there was a commission that recommended that the authority be merged into the Maryland Environmental Service so this bill sets forward the process to do that um, the authority very simply is a uh, is a, a creature of the legislature and it's uh, there are eight members of which Carol is one and it, uh, it it provides bonding service and then help with uh, all things waste, frankly. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about that further as as this bill works its way through. Uh, education already a number of bills, construction of sidewalks and crosswalks. We've had this bill in the past. It requires the Board of Ed to identify safe walking routes for students, and then the county needs to construct those sidewalks or crosswalks 
to comply with a report. The interesting thing is there are cross-jurisdictional issues too. There are going to be situations where schools are, uh, school zones are maybe next to a another jurisdiction, uh, municipality for example, or it could be on a state road. Uh, the, the bill would obligate the county to work with that other jurisdiction to make sure this happens. So that's going to be a challenge. Um, you'll also notice that um, I'll have uh, a, a notification here of either opposition or support. That's a MAKO position. Uh, so MAKO is in opposition to this bill. Um, the Interagency Commission on School Construction, uh, it's proposed to reduce the previous threshold of $4 million down to 100000 uh, to be considered an eligible cost on a sim systemic um, renovation costs in the school, and that would be effective for two years, FY 24 and 25. Uh, playground accessibility, communication boards. This, this bill would require each, would require the board of education to have communication boards installed in every playground. Um, and, and you're probably aware of this. I think there are some that exist in county parks as well. Um, Another big bill, House Bill 65, uh, collective bargaining for public libraries. So a bill was put forward last year by a Hartford County delegate that started out as a bill for collective bargaining in the Hartford County public library system. Um, I, I should back up and say that in order for a county to have collective bargaining in, in the library system, it needs legislation to do that. So there are four systems currently that have it, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, um, Montgomery, Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. and Howard. Right. Howard has the authority, but they haven't, right. they haven't entered into collective bargaining yet. So this bill established the procedures. Um, the challenge is right now the Board of Trustees have the authority on compensation, benefits, discipline. This would essentially allow for collective bargaining which would take that uh, that power away from mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, the board so you'll see Mako is in, in opposition to that now it does have uh, the you will have the ability to refuse that offer since you are the funding uh, governing body and and you fund the library um, another one uh, right now there is a prohibition on the Board of Education uh, negotiating maximum class size and this bill House Bill 85 would uh, would repeal that prohibition House Bill uh, 82 is uh, would allow the state to apply to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid services for authorization to receive reimbursement for mental health services uh, delivered in schools Obviously, and probably that's all I have to say on that. Anything you can get to assist in uh, in that, and and I think that's part of the blueprint as well to to add those services. So that's going to be that'll be huge. Um, in reference to what you said in the uh, Commissioner Rothstein and the Mako initiatives, um, the uh, SB 40, the Public Information Act, inspection of records. So essentially, this would limit fishing expeditions where someone would come and say, I want uh, the footage for all of your officers for the past year. Um, the, the request has to be kind of specific regarding an incident or a complaint or an allegation of misconduct of an officer, also protects witnesses, uh, minors. And then uh, lastly, under public safety, Senate Bill 45, uh, restrictive housing and correctional services. So it, it established a, a broad definition of vulnerable individuals. So that increases the number of, of inmates that would qualify as vulnerable individuals. It affords them a wide range of supplemental services and then prescribes uh, the way that, that they must be housed. So that would require additional and ongoing training for uh, for the staff, so that's being opposed by MAKO. And lastly, uh, 311 systems, which is the non-emergency system. Uh, the state has one. This is enabling legislation that would en enable a county to establish their own 311 system, or they can simply agree uh, to participate with the state's system. Um, so that's, that's the highlights I have to this point.
mm -hmm. and if you have any questions or you need me to follow up or if there's any other bills that you've become aware of that you need some background on please reach out to me any uh any questions from uh colleagues i know uh i saw a bill that i think uh delegate tomlinson is working with senator west on um recently uh i think it would be interesting to see what is being pushed forward from our delegation both in five and 42 we have three freshman delegates mm -hmm. you know uh of the you know of the group but um you know what's on their mind and what are they pushing through and then us having the ability also to discuss but if you can kind of keep your ear to the ground on that absolutely yeah we can we can make that a <coughs> category and yeah. keep keep track of those um, the other thing I'll, I'll just mention quickly is there may be bills that come through most of our positions are congruent with MAKO so we let MAKO take the lead on those but for bills that are, are really specific to Carroll um, or <coughs> Perhaps MAKO may come to the counties in, as they put a panel together for a bill. Um, we need to make sure that, that we meet the, the requirements of testifying, which is you need to sign up two days in advance. Mm -hmm. So if it's a bill that requires you to take a position, we need to stay ahead of that so we can, you're, you're only meeting as a body once a week. So you need to take a position in one of these sessions. We just make sure the timing is right so that we can get that testimony in, whether it's written or in person. Okay. And, and I think you um, you mentioned MAKO several times and, and their positions. And there are times where we feel that Carroll County maybe doesn't agree totally with them. Mm -hmm. We vote in a minority, but you, that's a good point. And then you also list uh, committee areas of jurisdiction, which is great. Um, is it possible, and I know that it's, it's, it's information available, but is it possible if you, you list the chair people? Correct. Could you list our local delegates, Absolutely. which ones they're on? Because yeah, some people might want to reach out to them for a specific committee, too. Absolutely. Because that's where a lot of the power is. That, that's, that's where everything happens. Right. Uh, yeah, it'll either, either live or die in the committee. In the committee. No question. I had a question. Is Senate Bill 81? I might have missed what you what you said. The support or opposition to that, the the, the minimum wage increase. Oh, oh yes, um, that is probably an opposition. I hope so. Yes, yes. Okay, that's actually uh, only because they haven't taken a position yet. That that hearing is not yeah. scheduled yet. So Mako will definitely be taking a position. I guess I'm probably speaking out of turn to say, but right. they they opposed it last year okay. in its original form. And um, I, I, I'm sure they will. Now, the counties are not greatly affected by this, um, not, not to a great degree. This is really going to affect the business community, obviously. Right. Um, but, but MAKO's stance in the past has been to oppose that. But, yeah, and, and this is a great example, kind of what uh, Commissioner Kyler said, is there's going to be positions from other jurisdictions uh, on Mako, that are going to be for it. Um, we will be in a minority. We are in a minority. I mean, that's just call it what it is. You know, you got five Republicans up here. We got a very conservative community and very fiscally conservative. Uh, you know, that that's who we are. And so, uh, anything like this is going to be we're not for. Um, but. Hopefully it'll stay and MAKO will continue to oppose this. But uh, just a good example is yes, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday was a legislative uh, meeting. And, you know, uh, benefits for military, police, and fire retirees to be increased. Well, MAKO was against it. I'm 100% for it. You know, uh, we have a problem keeping retirees in Maryland and those that are, you know, selfless serving our community, those in red, blue and green should, you know, get more benefits. Uh, I was in the minority. Uh, I pulled in a few folks, um, those that were retired police or fire or uh, military, but um, it was still in the minority. And that's 
the environment we live in. Um, and, you know, you, you can make your voice heard, but that's where we live. So, Yeah, and, and, and that's a really good point. We probably need to, to qualify that. So there will be positions that there is great disagreement. There is a gap. And, and actually, minimum wage may be, may be one because there are many of these larger counties that, that believe that's the way to go and have actually initiated that themselves. So there may be that may be the case when this comes up for a vote that there's too much disagreement and, and make a will take no position and then allow each county advocate their own position. Um, so we'll take that on on the issue you're speaking to directly on mm -hmm. the income tax subtraction modifications again that goes to the overall policy. Um, you you ha you don't have the authority to affect income taxes. You do have the authority to affect property taxes. Right. So, all of these subtraction modifications are income tax related. So the 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 position again is they should be state credits, and we so you mm -hmm. can certainly advocate for a state credit. Yeah. Should it should it come forward? So. Okay. Appreciate it, Mike, and uh, as we all know, you're always available for us, and really appreciate that. So. Thank you. Um, so item four, request approval for grant application acceptance of award, Carroll County Restoration Projects. Mr. Hine, why don't you come up? And I think you're up for the next three items. Yes. And just a, uh, a reminder of uh, those that want to speak um, to fill out an orange card, uh, if you haven't already. <clears throat> um, and then we'll go from there. Just, uh, just a friendly reminder, if uh, you haven't and you want to, Please fill out one of the orange cards in the back. Sir. Yes, good morning. What's on your mind? Yes. So I'm joined here today by Kelly Martin, who is our grants technician for the Bureau of Resource Management. And uh, just a FYI, over the past decade, uh, the Bureau of Resource Management has successfully obtained almost $17 million worth of grant funds to support our NPDES program. And that's what we're here for uh, today, is a request for a grant. Um, as I indicated last week to you all, we are preparing a presentation, for an inf informational presentation regarding the overall NPDES program that uh, that will kind of delve into those details. But one of the key items that we're required to perform per our permit is improve the quality of water in the county. And we do that through the construction of new and, and restoration projects on stormwater management facilities. And so every opportunity that we can, uh, we apply for grant funding to assist with that overall program. And so Kelly has uh, some information about a grant that we're looking to apply for uh, that I believe is due by the end of the month. So, Kelly? Okay. So we're seeking your approval to submit an application to the Maryland Water Infrastructure Financing Administration Bay Restoration Fund Wastewater Program to fund four um, best management practices. Two of these are new facilities, Manchester East and New Windsor Wetland, and two of them are existing facilities that we will retrofit, Winters Mill High School and Winter Street. This grant allows us to um, request 50% of the construction costs. So we are requesting $2,370,000. And um, this will, like Chris said, help us to meet our nutrient reduction requirements from our NPDES permit. Do you have any questions? OK, are there any questions on this? No? Is there a motion? I move the Board of County Commissioners <clears throat> approve the submittal of the grant application acceptance of the award to the Maryland Water Infrastructure Financing Administration Bay Restoration Fund Wastewater Program for the Carroll County Restoration Projects. Okay, I got a motion and a second. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's talk about the Public Safety Training Center Stormwater Retrofit. Yes. And, uh, so this is kind of a uh, unique um, application. So I have some background information for you. Thanks, Chris. For a loan application. Yes, so thank you. Will, um, thank you very much. So yes. 
So again, this is one of those technical topics that um, should you request additional information and a deep dive briefing on, we'd be happy to go into, but PFOS is something that uh, we will certainly be before you talking about more in the future. Um, what I provided you, I'm not planning on going through and, and giving you uh, and, and going into a lot of details. This is more for a takeaway so you can look at it later, um, but did want to give you a little bit of a, of a background and again, happy to answer any questions that you may have. So not sure if you're familiar at all with the term PFOS. It's a classification of a type of chemical. Uh, uh, there are approximately 5,000 plus uh, individual chemicals that make up that class. Uh, the chemical has been around for, uh, started manufacturing in the 1940s, and it's used primarily for two things. Um, one is to make things not stick, so think Teflon and, and Scotchgard, and it's also um, heat resistant. So think in terms of um, microwave popcorn bags um, and uh, firefighting um, equipment and uh, firefighting foams. So. Um, Scientific research by the EPA has indicated that there are health concerns related to PFOS. Let me click through some of these slides real quick. And uh, part of the issue with PFOS is that it's, um, it's everywhere, it's in a lot of things, and it doesn't break down, so it's often termed a forever chemical. And there are concerns about uh, the effects on, on health, and there are some um, some uh, studies that have indicated that they're links to cancer and, and things like that. So uh, it's, a con it's a concern. Um, to give you an update as far as the regulatory climate, where we are, at the federal level in 2016, the EPA set a what's called a health advisory limit for PFOS, and they set that at 70 parts per trillion. And so uh, what a health advisory limit is or level is, uh, it basically says if you have this amount in your drinking water, you should be concerned, um, but it does not require you to do anything about it. Um, individual states have taken actions on their own to, to, um, to address it. Uh, Maryland has not at this point. In uh, this past June, June 2022, the EPA revised that health advisory limit down to one part per trillion. So uh, studies are indicating that even in even smaller concentrations, it, it may be an issue. Uh, indications from the EPA are that they're currently working on what's called a maximum con contaminant level or an MCL that will become that would be regulatory. So if you, when they set that level, if you have um, contaminant levels higher than that in your drinking water, you will be required to address them. So MDE, the Maryland Department of the Environment, is following suit with what the EPA is, is doing. So um, after the EPA sets those uh, requirements, MDE will follow suit. So how does that affect us? So Maryland Department of the Environment um, wanted to know how big of an issue is this around the state. So they tested 132 con community drinking water supplies around the state, and there were two primary hits, um, both unfortunately here in Carroll County. One was in Hampstead, and one was in or Westminster. So both municipalities immediately took those wells offline and have been working with MDE to, ad to address those. The one that's located in Westminster is at what's called the Votech Well, which is adjacent to the Public Safety Training Center, which is why we're here today. So here's a map of the Public Safety Training Center, and we have a stormwater facility that's part of that training center just to the north of it. And you can see off to the side here um, is the well for the city of Westminster. So. Um, as you would expect, when MDE uh, measured, uh, determined there were contaminant levels of PFOS in that well, they reached out to the county and said, um, can you take a look at what's on your site and, and figure out if you're a potential source of that contamination? And so last year we hired a consultant to did some testing and yes, there's good evidence that there's contaminated soil um, on the Public Safety Training Center site. So, we received a letter from MDE in December, which basically said they don't have any regulatory authority at this time, because again, we're waiting for the EPA and then so on, um, but they will be coming back to us and they will be asking, looking for us to address the contamination that's, that there's evidence is on the site. So um, why we're here today is um, as a first step, that stormwater management facility has standing water, and as stormwater runs into it, it then has the ability to interface with the ground, 
right? So it can pick up that PFAS contamination. So we feel that it would be a good first step to address issues there is to retrofit that facility, put a liner in so that the surface water doesn't interface with the ground anymore. We also have the added benefit of, of um, we can get credit for our NPDES program, which we're required to do anyways, and there are other benefits, environmental benefits to it. So we're looking, we've programmed this in as a potential project. At the same time, MDE has a loan program uh, related specifically to PFAS contamination. And that loan is a principal forgiveness loan. So what that means is that we apply for the loan, if they issue it to us, we have to keep that loan on our books for 10 years. We do not have to pay administrative costs, we do not have to pay interest, and at the end of the 10 years, we don't have to pay the principal back either. So it's essentially a grant, but it requires that we stay engaged with the, with the project. They can come out and inspect it, make sure that it's functioning as designed and so on. I wish I could get a loan like that. Yes, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> so, so I'm sorry, Chris, yes. what, what is the reasoning for them wanting us to keep the loan for 10 years? Uh, that's just the, the parameters of the loan application, yeah. I, I was just curious, maybe it's, they, they say, okay, well, we give you this loan and you have 10 years of, of you know, activity on it or yeah. something. And it's a commitment, I, it it's a commitment. Like. Yeah, it's a commitment to make sure that for 10 years we don't turn around and sell the infrastructure right. that we put right. in place and, or, and that we're maintaining it well and so on. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, the loan application is due at the, uh, at the end of the month. Um, one of the benefits of a loan is that we can put in a request for the entire amount of the project. As we just uh, talked about with grants, typically to be successful with grants, we have to, the county has to have skin in the game. We, we ask for a grant for half of it and the county puts up half. In this case, we anticipate the total cost, both engineering design and construction, will be under a million dollars. So the million dollars is the request amount that we would be going to the state with. So, now that's a fire hose of a lot of information about PFAS and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I'll turn it over to Kelly to give you a little more specifics, but again, happy to answer any questions that you have. I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> any, any specific questions about the application? I see a lot of commercials about PFAS, you know, and mm -hmm. the dangers of PFAS. So, um, and I think there's just so much that we're still learning, mm -hmm. you know, about the effects of PFAS. I mean, it's, it's amazing that we're looking at particles within trillions. Yes. You know, that's, that, you know, you can't even fathom that except mm -hmm. knowing it's a number. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, I mean, uh, there, there's no risk in taking a 0% loan for 10 years and not even paying it back after the 10 years. So, um, Quick question, Chris, or I, and I might've misheard you. Are we putting anything up ourselves towards this or is, are they covering that full amount no they would cover the, the entire amount yes but I was just double checking so, but but what I would say is that um, from a timing perspective um, this is a project that we feel is important and, oh, absolutely. and I mean, so dealing with water and environment absolutely yeah. so we're proceeding with getting a, a consultant on board to start the design process um, there is a potential that we do not receive the loan so the county would be investing the money in the design and so on um, but that's just to keep it moving forward gotcha. if we are successful with a loan we can back get reimbursed for those design costs we should find out in September I think you're big enough to get the loan if not, <laughs> bring your dog. He's okay. Enough, so, so okay. The, uh, uh, so the, the the plan is to know what the cost for the engineering uh, survey is going to be in September, or we're going to have the when are we going to know the cost for the survey? So uh, because of the um, the urgency of, of this issue, uh, we're, we're moving th through this as quickly as possible. We are putting out the RFP for the design um, within a week or two. And so we will have a design consultant on board within a month. Um, my intention is that we get the design completed by the end of the summer and ready for construction. So we'll have a very solid engineer's cost estimate for the construction costs um, by the time we hear about whether we have the loan or not. Okay. And, and, and no chance we get stuck paying off the loan? So if you um, do not meet the terms of the loan, they could always um, require us to pay it back. 
but that my understanding is that it's primarily an accounting type exercise of um, we have to report on the loan that we've got it that we're keeping it on our books and so they can uh, they can come out and inspect the facility and make sure we're maintaining it properly and so on as long as we meet the terms of the loan then the uh, principal would be forgiven okay and, and I and I and I understand the concern here and it makes sense that there's probably a lot of that there mm -hmm. uh, but you know given the budget constraints we're looking at I just think we have to be extra, pay extra attention to the fact that if we're getting some free money and we're still dishing out money, like the last project, we're still dishing out $500,000 to mm -hmm. get $500,000. So we're still spending $500,000. Yes. So just something we need, I think, I know personally we need to remain cognizant of as we're moving forward. I don't know if there's really any free money. I'm not convinced yeah. yet. No. There's no free horse. <coughs> no free money. Okay. Good discussion. Is there uh, <clears throat> any further discussion? If not, is there a motion? Motion to approve the submittal of the application and acceptance of award to the Maryland Water Infrastructure Financing Administration for the Public Safety Training Center Stormwater Retrofit. Second. Okay, I got a motion. I got a second. Again, good discussion. Any further discussion? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris, you're two for two. The next one is a briefing presentation regarding s community solar code uh, what you will provide is information only we can provide more after that thank you again a reminder if there's anyone who would like to speak uh, regarding this topic or any topic for that matter fill out a uh, orange card give it to the mass lady to my right your left and um, <clears throat> the intent is to uh, go through the overview that's provided in front of us. Um, yeah, I think it's the same slide deck. Uh, go through the overview that's uh, uh, the slide deck in front of us. Have uh, discussion amongst us and um, ideas and thoughts in us moving forward. Prior to decision being made, um, to ensure that we hear from you, the community, whether you're here or on the phone uh, from above. Um, and then it'll be in that order, and then we will uh, have the opportunity to make a decision if necessary. Um, I just wanna, again, preface this. I learned a lot in the town hall, and I was very appreciative of everything said and how we represent the entire county and not just a district is so important uh, in moving forward. So, um, what's your name? Chris, go ahead. <laughs> so, I'm um, joined here today with, um, uh, by Brenda Denny, who is my special projects coordinator. And she was uh, very involved in uh, working with uh, the previous board and other staff to develop um, the uh, community solar uh, text amendment that was put in place a couple years ago. So she's going to, as Commissioner Rothstein said, uh, we'll walk through kind of a high level overview. Uh, we've given you the slide deck for your uh, reference and uh, then we're happy to hear any discussion. Ms. Brenda. Good morning. Good morning. It's still morning, right? <laughs> so I, I think the important thing um, when we're looking at this, what the you know, zoning text amendment that was done previously is why we did it. And the state has been moving for a number of years towards um, increasing the amount of mm -hmm. renewable energy usage or provision in the, in the state, including um, setting certain goals that's been done through legislation for certain amounts of renewable energy that has to be um, represented in our portfolio in the state by certain years. Um, so because of that, there's also been a number of moves towards potentially mandating um, how much solar needs to be provided in each county, including legislation that was introduced in the past two years but didn't pass, but has been introduced that would have a committee looking at each county to say, all right, you're, you need to have this much solar in your county, and then we would be forced to look for places where we had to provide that. So um, in an effort to show a good faith effort to provide a certain amount of solar so that um, 
you know, that's less likely that they will come in and mandate because we are already showing that we're trying to provide something. Um, the community, the previous board asked that we um, put together this community solar proposal and, and then the amendment that was eventually adopted. So to me, that's the most important, you know, thing to take out of why this was even done. Um, so I think you probably un already understand that the community solar is, it's a small scale compared to like utility scale uh, solar and it's, it is a commercial enterprise but it's subscription based. So a household needs to subscribe to a certain amount of energy. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be located um, on your property in order to be able to use it. Uh, under the pilot program, and this was originally a pilot program established by the state in 2015, uh, that expires, it's been, it was extended a couple times and it expires next year. So hence the rush for a lot of community solar developers to get their applications in because right now, as of now, that program expires and they would not be able to submit any more applications. There is a bill in the General Assembly right now that would eliminate the pilot portion of that program and extend it like indefinitely. So then it would just be a permanent program. Um, so, but as of now, it expires next year. The, um, the, the facilities were stepped capped by state legislation originally at two megawatts, which is, um, I apologize, the slides show two megawatts, but it was, a, a, and yours showed five, it was a increase to a cap of five megawatts per facility. And that industry standards roughly um, five acres of solar panels per megawatt. So, so the answer is it, that one, two, three, four, fifth bullet is five megawatts per C6. Not Correct. two. Okay. I think yours show five, but it on does. the screen it shows okay. two. Yeah. So it's five. Okay. That like I said, that was extended by legislation last year. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry. If I may, though, the community solar text amendment that the, that the board passed, though, limits it at two. Two. So even though the state has increased it last year, increased it to five, our limitation is still two. Okay. I was going to mention that later. But <laughs> That's right. Sorry, stole your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> so when we were putting this together, we tried to... Uh, obviously make opportunities to increase solar access and, and the Board of Commissioners specifically requested that we look at remaining portions because it was a finite, um, well I'll get into some of the reasons why, but um, but also while we're at doing that, like minimize farmland impacts, look at community concerns and try to, you know, we looked at what they are in other jurisdictions that, that did stuff like this and um, listened to some of what we heard and from our community and try to come up with ways with try to mitigate some of those concerns. There's, there's no way to tr completely m eliminate them, but try to at least minimize it. And then um, some of that was co-location requirements with agricultural use so that would offer other benefits and also continue in agricultural use. So our requirements that were adopted with the zoning requires it to be in an agricultural district on a remaining portion and I think that we um, we told you the remaining portion is, you know, you, you take a property in the agricultural zoning district, if you take off your residential lots, the property that's left over is the remaining portion. Mm -hmm. So it's a currently a principal permitted use, if, you know, if they meet all the requirements, maximum of 20 acres can be used for the solar facility and that includes not just the panels but all the associated infrastructure including the landscape buffer, the access road, the converter, I mean inverter, all of those things are, have to be in that 20 acres and it can't go on anything that was a remaining portion created after July 1st of 2020. So if somebody came in now and subdivided their property they wouldn't be able to use the remaining portion for this purpose. In the pilot program? No, this is, this is Carroll this County. Is our code. County. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Everything now is our is, Got our it. Program. Okay. So then after the facility is, is developed, the rest of the property that isn't used for the solar use has to go into a conservation easement, which is permanent and would allow primarily only agricultural uses on that portion of the property. So part of the reason for doing that was, again, to address concerns about potential expansion of these facilities in the future. If they're limited to acreage, then, uh, and then an easement's put on the rest of the property, that easement wouldn't allow that solar use, so that helps to limit the expansion of those properties. Um, 
Of course, it requires a site plan, and the Planning Commission has to review and approve that. And there's some um, environmental resource restrictions. Again, the co-location requirements would help to sort of provide some benefits to agriculture by either continuing an some sort of agricultural use under the panels or requiring that they um, obtain a solar generation pollinator-friendly designation from Maryland Department of the Environment. And of course, the pollinator-friendly species provides bees, helps with pollination of crops. Um, the other thing, the next thing would be the landscape buffer. Again, trying to minimize what people see by creating a landscape buffer on from public rights away and adjoining residential uh, properties. Uh, the idea it's of it was to provide, and you can kind of see the picture on the screen, was to provide a berm that would, you know, block the view. Um, I'm not sure if you know if that's happening or not, but that would that was the uh, the intent, and then that would be year-round screening from time of installation. So once that's on the ground, you have to not be able to see it. It's not like I plant a little tree and then it grows in 10 years. Then. Um, you know, we got some other associated things, uh, the height and bulk and um, stuff has to be underground. And there is an abandonment and decommissioning plan that's required that would um, describe how they plan to remove the facilities and uh, remediate the soil. And it also requires a public works agreement and bond so that, that the county would hold if that facility is abandoned or whatever, somehow they're not around to remove the stuff, they've left us a bond to pay for the removal of that facility. So those are the general requirements. There are, um, so when you look at what properties we consider eligible, there's like 22,000 or so acres, but in reality, that's just the properties that are remaining portions, but doesn't mean they would all actually be suitable. And so if you look at what the solar developer has to look at, um, this prox you know, a property proximity to the distribution lines, like one, less than a mile is ideal, but really not le more than two miles because um, it's just it cost prohibitive to extend lines beyond that. The capacity of the lines. So the distribution lines have a certain capacity themselves. And if you are going to connect in a facility that generates energy and adds to the capacity, you know, what's already being um, moved on those lines, it has to be within that capacity. So one, one of the things they have to do is check with the utility company and be sure that there's capacity. If there's not capacity, they can't be connected in. Um, and then the site constraints, the cost, and they have PSC approval and, as I mentioned, approval by the utility company that they'd be connecting in with. So the process, of course, is to get approval from the utility company get approval from the Maryland Public Service Commission, and then they submit a site plan to the county. And you can see on the right side of this slide, they go through the process with um, concept plan, technical review committee, in which there's um, public review, public comment available at that point. Then the planning commission reviews the concept plan, and again, public comment is, can be taken there. They review a final uh, site plan and then approve it, and then the documents are submitted along with the easement agreement is prepared at that point. Chris, are there any that have gone past the technical review committee at this time? They've yes. I'm not saying that they've gone through technical review, but are passed. Okay. This yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this is the next slide oh, shows. Right. <laughs> I did this for you, so go ahead. <laughs> See, I knew what you were going to ask. Um, we currently have five um, community solar projects that have been submitted and have gotten to the technical review committee point in this stage, but they have not gotten through the right. planning commission okay. concept. That's what I want to right. hear. Got it. So the planning commission has not even yet yep. had a chance to look at Good. these, and um, and they do have the authority to add conditions on top of what's already required. For interest, also, is this slide deck available? Uh, will it be available? I can put it on yes. our community solar Please website. Do. Because yes. if, if folks are taking pictures, which is fine, mm -hmm. but let's make this available for them Absolutely. as well. Okay, yes. thanks. And then, of course, you know, after the, so we have those five that haven't yep. gotten. And then um, just the last two slides are just yep. QR codes for the, that website that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. and also uh, for the community solar booklet, and then my contact information. That's kind of an overview 
Okay. If you had any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If, if, if acceptable, um, and, and public comment is so important, so I want to say this first. I would like to make a motion, and then provided I get a second, we will discuss mm -hmm. and we will listen to public comment. Correct. And that way they know where we're possibly headed. If I don't get a second, we'll still listen to public comment. Correct. Okay. I move the Board of County Commissioners direct the county attorney to prepare an ordinance establishing a six-month moratorium on the submission, review, and processing of current and future applications for community solar energy systems in Carroll County to enable the Department of Planning to review it and, if appropriate, make recommendations to modify Chapter 158 Community Solar Energy Generator Systems, particularly 158.070A and 158.153E Community Solar Energy Systems in Agricultural Zones. Second. Second. So I think you got you guys. So I think you got a motion and uh, four seconds. So we know where this is going to be going, since uh, yeah, um, and let's have a little bit of discussion because it, I think it warrants it from us uh, in the value of making this um, decision moving forward as we see it going forward. In accordance with Robert's rules, <laughs> let's open up for discussion and that individual who made the motion has the opportunity to speak first. Um, this position in no way is anti-solar. I support solar on ag property, some of my neighbors have it, when the energy is used on that property. Solar fields are not a good use of ag property in my opinion. They are also not fair to neighboring residents. I think quality of life in, is so critical in Carroll County. That's what makes our county special. Most of the agricultural community and the residential community, particularly where a solar field is now visible to their highway or they think it will be, is opposed to solar fields in ag zones. We need to encourage solar energy generating systems in commercial, employment campus districts, industrial zones. We need to encourage rooftop solar in residential neighborhoods on rooftops to serve that house. We've seen much public comment lately. Um, I think we probably got a half a dozen emails probably while we were sitting here, and obviously a few people want to speak about it. So I just think now's the time. We, we can't let this go further, and uh, that's where I'm coming from. But, of course, we don't answer emails while we're on the dais no, because no, that no. would be I'm, a bad thing. That's why I said I, I would bet. <laughs> I didn't look. That's right. I promise. So, uh, okay. Are there other comments that folks want to make from the dais? Sure. I'd, uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative that we brought this up. Uh, when I started meeting with residents last spring, it was apparent that that something would need to be done. Uh, there are many questions, which is why we're doing what we're doing. I have many as a resident, I have many. And as a commissioner, uh, I have specific ones uh, that as a board, I'm, I'm hoping we can address. In addition to some of the excellent points that Commissioner Kyler meant, uh, stated, uh, some of them include ensuring that our fire and EMS personnel are prepared to deal with all emergency contingencies related to these projects. I know we've mentioned a little bit about what happens if these projects are decommissioned, but I want to ensure that this county is not left holding the bag on anything. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if one of the solar companies uh, ceases to exist? I think the same thing applies. I just want to make sure we're protected. Uh, I'm concerned about the deforestation issue there. There seems to be some, some things that need to be maybe worked out in that as well. Deforestation versus just clearing some trees. Uh, what that really means for people who live nearby. And, and really, uh, I mean, m as importantly, uh, is Carroll County prepared to manage these types of projects reasonably given our limited resources? I think that's a discussion we're going to have to have with you. I want to make sure you have the people and the expertise you need to deal with these types of projects because there's 10 today maybe, but there's going to be 20, where there's going to be 30, which is why we're taking the action we're taking now. Now is the right time to do this. Uh, a moratorium is reasonable. Doing so would provide us the time we need to hold additional hearings, study the issues, gather more public comments, and do what is right for residents, the land, and our county. 
uh, th this is not a difficult decision for me. This is the right decision. I'll Any other comments? I'll just echo a little bit of what Commissioner Guerin just said. I completely agree wholeheartedly with his statement as well as uh, the motion by Commissioner Kyler. Um, I personally, I will say I'm not against solar. I'm not against us looking at other energy. I think the question is we don't have enough answers at this point. So I think the prudent thing is to get more answers while we're still at this point in this place in this process versus trying to backtrack down the road, which uh, clearly none of us want to do. Obviously, we have a huge agricultural uh, community here. It's one of our largest uh, employers, and it's part of what makes this county what this county is. So from my perspective, we want to utilize the quality we have while looking to add to that without potentially creating whether it be safety issues regarding our fire EMS or any other uh, issues regarding this topic and uh, you know the uh, the concept of how we're going to potentially see these removed in the future is one that uh, I do have some questions I won't say concerns at this point but definitely questions of how that does play out and uh, given the nuances of this industry I think we need to take a little more time looking at it thank you would you like to speak there, Commissioner Vigliotti? Thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. I am uh, totally in support of the moratorium. I want to associate myself with all the comments made so far. Um, I also want to add a few. I, uh, I will have a lot more to say about this in the, uh, the future. I have a well thought out and reasoned argument, for, but for some uh, off the cuff comments this morning. Uh, you know, we always talk about this county from a sense of love. You know, this is our home and we love the place in which we live. It's a, it's a love of, of everything that we are. And so when we ask ourselves, you know, who are we, right? You know, how does something like solar fit into our county? And you have to ask questions uh, therein about the community, about agriculture, and above all about the people who live here, the people who work here. Uh, and you know, if we are as serious as we say we are about agricultural preservation and understanding the necessity of agriculture, not just as it determines who we are as a county, but as our country relies upon farmers and relies upon farms, uh, you know, then we have to say, yes, we need to make measures to protect that farmland. And so in my mind, and I understand that there's some discussion about whether you know, land that is ag remainder uh, uh, you know, does constitute a place where a solar development, and we, when we talk about solar, by the way, it's not a farm, it's not a field, this is a solar development, it's something that actually is installed. So, you know, do these things fit into the area? And for me, the answer is, you know, decidedly no. I don't even think that these things should go on land that is ag remainder. Uh, so I, uh, you know, to, to summarize, I mean, I'm totally in support of the uh, moratorium and the reexamination of this. Again, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to solar. I'm just opposed to where it goes. Cannot stand following Commissioner Vigliotti with his <laughs> eloquent ways of saying things. So I'll let Commissioner Kyler first just, jump well, in. Well, just one one more <laughs> sentence. And I thought I thought thought this through and prepared, and uh, not quite. I want to thank you guys for all the work you've done with this. I feel like. Um, Hindsight's wonderful, and you gave me a lot of information to look at, and I much appreciate that. Th none of this is disrespect for the work staff has done to right. put this together. No, I, and I appreciate that, and I absolutely agree. Um, you know, the, the decisions that we made regarding solar started in December 20th when the Board of County Commissioners directed the staff to take a look at this. <clears throat> it went through public and zoning commission I think five times came back to us went to public hearing and then finally in the middle of May it became an ordinance so it took a a good six months to go from start to finish I think the moratorium that we are working to put in place will allow for uh, you know a, it, I think it'll provide enough time uh, where things can change appropriately and we're not going to get stuck. Um, every one of our meetings is open, and I've shared this, and um, every one of those events that I mentioned are wide open. The challenge is communicating to the community to ensure that they have an understanding of why your voice matters. Um, and that's very difficult that is extremely difficult as we're sitting up here in the dais 
making decisions from the dais, you know, is not of value if it's not coming from the community. It's got to come from the community to allow us to make these decisions. And although we made that decision in 2021 for all the right reasons with the information we had at the time, knowing that renewable energy, the push for renewable energy, uh, you know, was right in front of us. And um, we had to make, you know, where were we were going to go. It's still going to be in front of us, and especially with this new administration. No doubt about it that it's going to be in front of us. Uh, and it's going to be, like, hitting us real hard. So we're going to have to be relatively clever um, on how we move forward. But I said from the very beginning, uh, you know, it's not about being a politician. It's about being a selfless servant a community servant, uh, listen, learn, lead. These town halls mean so much, and it's not just this last one, uh, but the appreciation I have in the town halls when folks can come up and share their insight, their candidness, knowing that they can be candid, gives me an opportunity to just listen and then take it back and package it. I shared everything that was shared, uh, that was provided, um, in an email to uh, my colleagues, not to have discussion, because that wouldn't be a good thing to do, but to provide information <clears throat> and uh, the sentiment that they had already known because of your input in the community. But it, it got us to a position now to lead and move forward and uh, taking the next step that's appropriate with this moratorium where we see where this is gonna go. I've said also, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And uh, there's a right place for everything. And there's a right place for everything here in Carroll County, um, in our community, maintaining our culture, um, and really maintaining our character. I mean, that's why I moved here many years ago, knowing that the community was wrapping their arms around my family. Uh, and I don't want that to go away. So the fact is, if we need to make a change, then let's make a change. Um, and that that's fine. Uh, it doesn't take away from the work that the staff does, you know. It uh, allows them to step back, do a little bit more work, and come back to us with, uh, you know, what right looks like. And, um, yeah, that, that's kind of my, my two cents. Um, not nearly as eloquent as Commissioner Vigliotti, but, uh, you know, I try. What I know is at this point, before we make our final vote, first off, is there any other conversation where I'd like to hear, I know there's orange cards out there. Um, so, Mass Lady, Ms. Roberta, why don't you uh, call them up? Mark Hamilton. So when you're gonna come up, you come up to the center, to the microphone, say your name, uh, your address. You'll have a few minutes to uh, share your thoughts. It's not designed to go back and forth. Um, and we'll go from there. Would I be able to sit? If you'd like to, please. I, I, would, I would prefer. I'm going to grab your back. That's easy for me. You can get old. It's <laughs> all good. Trust me. I got a bad hip right now. now well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Rothstein for these uh, commissioner meetings and open floor. Uh, that would, uh, citizens come in here and express their concerns and issues. Uh, I'd also like to thank him for uh, the town hall meetings with two flexible, two different times, which convenient either for people that work or don't work. So I thank you for that, first thing. Um, I'd like to welcome the four incoming uh, commissioners. And um, I just wanted to speak about the issue with me and the uh, solar farm, proposed solar farm, going up in front of my house. And I've been, and I've been with. Do uh, you mind I've giving your name and address? Carroll County for 30 years. That way we years. know where. I apologize. Your your name and address. Your your name and address. What what is your name? Name and address. And address. We'll what? Name and address. Okay, Mark Hamilton, nine eight one Fanny Dorsey Road. Got it. District four. Got with it. Mike. Um. Now, um, just a brief statement. No, okay, the, this, I, 
myself and people from, I know, two other areas in, in this room where this is taking place right now. Um, we feel this, this, these solar farms belong more in industrial, commercial areas, and they shouldn't be uh, planned in agricultural to agricultural borderline um, residential communities. And that's, that's what's happening in my case. My side of the road's commercial. The other side of the road is um, agricultural. So in, in my case, you know, my wife and I have been there. I've lived there. I've been a, a county resident since 1985, living in my house. It was two years old when I purchased it. And you know, we wanted a nice, quiet place to raise a family and then a place afterwards to retire and spend our golden years in, which, which is where we're at right now. And we don't plan on going anywhere else. We just want to live our whatever remaining life we have left in, in our neighborhood and in our house. But uh, it, right now, they're, they have a proposed solar farm that's going up across the street from me. Here's my house. I'm standing at a white flag exactly 69 feet behind the property line on the opposite side of the road, 225 foot off the front wall of my house, and I'm looking back toward my property. <laughs> this is the view I've had. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back real quick. Real quick. This was just taken yesterday. This is my front window view. What I'm used to for 38 years. I have my two cats enjoying it. <laughs> okay, now. Here's the solar farm across the street from my house. Right. Directly across the street from my house. Where they propose to put this. Well, I mean, this is it is just. I, it's just a total insult to have something like that proposed to go in front of your house where you've been living for 38 years and don't plan on going nowhere. Okay. That's, you know, it, it's, it's just something you would never expect in your lifetime. It's, it's just not, it's not, doesn't belong there. It doesn't belong in these type of areas. Um, right now, I know. Uh, Carroll County um, Department of Land and Resource Management Agricultural Land Preservation Mission and Goal is to permanently preserve 100,000 acres of agricultural land throughout the county. Uh, this, this proposal by them is, is a direct um, conflict with installing um, solar farms in agricultural areas. It's, it's just the opposite what what they want to do. Uh, and right now they're at, I believe, 75,000 acres have been preserved. But Sir, if you can, finish up your thoughts. I'm sorry? F finish up your thoughts. Yeah. It, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't yes. make sense. And yes, sir. Like I say, it's, it's something that should be Commercial or in an industrial, not okay. residential, uh, agricultural. It's just total. Uh, <laughs> doesn't make sense. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, that's I, that's I, great, uh, basically I, what I'd like no, to say. I appreciate I, it. Thank you. Thank you. Express my thoughts. Yep. Stephen Roberts. I'll speak up here. Can you hear me? Sure. Good morning, uh, Steve Roberts, yeah. 6571 Jasana Court. Okay. So most people are long-term Carroll County residents. I am not. I spent 20 years overseas. I've done four war zone assignments. I brought my family back to Maryland in 2010. We bought our house in 2010. We bought our house because Carroll County is about the views, the quality of life, as you've mentioned before. Uh, most people are not against solar, we mentioned that, but it doesn't belong in the view of my house or anybody else's. Um, solar Amendment 158, 153, 
I'm so glad that you're putting the moratorium on this, but define what moratorium means. Does it mean that solars that are being processed now are going to stop today? So, I, you know, if this moratorium goes through, that is the intent, is that actions moving forward with, I think there's 10 right now in the queue, we so will have a moratorium moving forward with those. Going actually, if I so may So my clarify. taxpayer okay, dollars bear, will bear, not one, fund. One second, sir. I just want to make sure yes, it's defined correctly. Yeah, and, the, and this is an important point. So to clarify, community solar is a, is codified by the state, like it's a term for, the, for a subscription-based solar and so on. There are 10 of those going through the process right now through development review. Four of those are on industrial property, and one is located in the town of Manchester. So those... I don't want to speak for you, but I would think would be appropriate to continue through the process because they don't, they're not part of the community solar text amendment that we've been discussing, which is, pro, which is solar on ag remaining portions. Correct. So there are five that are going through on ag remaining well, portions. I, I appreciate and staying corrected. So out of the 10, there are five on ag property. The moratorium is focused on those five, is, on, is focused on the ag community solar so, so clarify my tax dollars will not be putting resources into those until this moratorium has made a decision moving forward the more uh, so short answer yes the way where you're going with this the moratorium will take place if this vote from the five of us moves forward well, um so go ahead have the whole, you, this but, is this it would be an ordinance. Yeah. No, I, I, you're right. I, I apologize. If I, yeah, go if, ahead. If I, this may be a, if, if we can, this may be a great time. And I knew this, we all knew this would happen. Yeah. This may be a great time for our attorney mm, to describe the process of what's about, or maybe about to happen. <laughs> Is that I hate to put you on the spot, sir, but if no, no, but it's, this, no, I appreciate it because timing is, yeah, yeah, and yeah. There's yeah. a motion before the commissioners. Uh, to direct me to draft a moratorium ordinance. Uh, if that passes on uh, next week's agenda, I will present them with a draft of an ordinance that, uh, as Commissioner uh, Kyler requested, mm -hmm. puts a uh, moratorium on the acceptance or further processing of any uh, of any of these uh, community solar projects in the agricultural zone for a period of six months. If they like the, how the ordinance looks, it will, they will ask me to schedule a public hearing, which would be done in approximately uh, three weeks. I have to allow for two, two, uh, two advertisements in the Carroll County Times. At the public hearing, it'll be similar to this process. Each party will be given three minutes to uh, speak in favor or against the proposed moratorium. At the close of the public hearing, uh, an additional 10 days will have to elapse, at which time the commissioners will take a final vote on that. Okay. And then the moratorium would take. And then the more the moratorium if that all yes. if passed. takes place. Right. Thank you for that. Right. Thank you for your time. I Absolutely. plead with you, vote for this moratorium. Would you buy a house with twenty <laughs> acres of solar farm in your backyard or in your front yard as Mark just presented? Think about it. Nobody would buy his house. He's stuck with it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy Roberts. And thanks, Tim. I'm Sandy Roberts. I'm at 6571 Chasana Court. And thank you so much. We're very grateful. A um, little emotional, too. We really appreciate that you are putting forward the moratorium. And we appreciate all of your hard work and consideration on this. As my husband said, we moved to Carroll County after returning from overseas. And we moved here from, we had lived in Howard before we moved overseas, and we saw what happened to their beautiful farmland. And we knew that Carroll County had done a great job of preserving farmland, and we loved the atmosphere, and that's why we chose the county. We um, are, were afraid that with the passing of this amendment, uh, we would see lots of solar farms popping up in residential communities such as ours, where homes are looking at them out of their windows. Um, so we're really happy about the moratorium. Um, the way this all came about for us was we noticed surveyors right behind our fence. 
um, on the property behind us, and I went out and asked them, you know, could you explain what, what's going on? And they seemed surprised that I didn't know. They said, you, you're not aware there's a 20-acre solar farm being planned on this field behind your house. And I was shocked because this particular field that we're talking about is bordered on three sides by homes. The homes on Fanny Dorsey, the homes on Jasana Court, and then I'm not, I think it might be part of Fanny Dorsey, but there are homes on the other side of the field as well, in full view of the homes that we're talking about. Um, as my husband said, the chance of selling a home that looks out over this goes way down. I would never buy one. I am concerned that I might be stuck with one. And also, I think the health implications are unknown because solar farms are so new. We don't really know. There's not enough research, and believe me, we've combed the internet, to know what is going to happen to our water. You can speculate, but we really, we're in, it, it, this is all new in terms of our, our communities and our nation, really. Um, and we realize that property owners have rights, but when one property owner's rights affects so many others in a negative way, it just doesn't seem ethical or right. Once again, we are not against solar. We just feel that it should be in industrial areas, commercial areas, not put in the middle of a residential community where everyone has to look at it and deal with the implications of it. So um, we are thankful for the work that you're doing, and um, we hope the moratorium is formally voted on. As you can see, it is the wish of most of the community members that you've been hearing from. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Hall. Craig Hall, 6570 Jasana Court. Uh, thank you all for addressing this issue. Um, I'm one of those long-term Carroll County residents. Grew up in Finksburg. I know the Deer Park facility uh, that's proposed. Lived on Hoods Mill. I know the Hoods Mill uh, location as well. And now I know the two locations on uh, Fanny Dorsey. Not against solar. I'll give you the bullet points. Not against solar. Um, a property owner has the right to do whatever they want on their property until it affects the community. The decision to put solar industrial type solar facilities next to residential areas, in my opinion, bad decision. So I want to thank you for addressing this. I obviously support the moratorium. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a procedural question before I talk. Um, I know I signed up, but th there was other testimony about other items. I'd just like to make a brief comment about those before I talk about the solar. Is that fine? It's name not. Uh, name is Jack Hayden, uh, 3775 Aaron Jacob Drive, Tawnytown, Maryland. So the uh, the issue on the uh, uh, previous discussions about. PFAS, PFAS. I, I apologize. Talk into the mic. Okay, so. about the chemical uh, issue and the uh, the Northeast Maryland waste disposal going into merge with MES. Um, brief comment on those. The the you need to know the backstory, and you need to know it's buried. In, you know the devil's in the details. Uh, the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority was created to finance the incinerator in Baltimore City. Uh, as a public facility, and now, I, because of time constraints on what you're talking about, that's a legislative issue, and I can get Mr. Fowler and others to have that conversation with you um, about that. Or I can present it to you guys in an email, I guess. That'd be because great. Because three minutes is, is just unfair. You guys get to talk all day. We get three minutes. It's ridiculous. So I'll talk about the solar. Okay. okay? Great for the moratorium. Uh, the, the you know thanks for the council listening to us uh, I know it's your biggest and maybe only power is the zoning laws you know you can't legislate laws and, and et cetera et cetera but this was a gross and misjudged use of change in the zoning law to put commercial use in agricultural zoning it's just totally a mistake 
and it should be reversed. That's what should be done with this, and it should be done in commercial land. Um, lots of questions. Um, uh, why is why is this being pushed in ag? Doesn't make any sense. And there's industrial. You guys mentioned it. Rooftops. The people pushing this. Do they live in in, in Carroll County? They're going to profit from it. Do they live in Carroll County? The profits going here. Probably no. It's wildly profitable, by the way. The zoning stuff. It's funny how the utilities are protecting it for themselves. And if we do our little solar thing, we only we can use it. Uh, we can't make any money on it. Um, I have, you know, I have electric car, I have solar, I'm, I'm putting on my roof. Um, and this solar community website, I, I haven't done enough study on it. Is that the county doing that? Is that these, is this county, these publications that look like comic they books? Are. You know, they're, they're talking, making it look like, you know, it's, it's, it's this great thing. You know, green energy, you know, kids study about it. You know, it's a commercial business. And these are county dollars. The government shouldn't be allowed, and Maryland shouldn't be allowed to jam down on the counties, all these mandates. And you gotta be fearful of them. Big Daddy doesn't control us, you know? We can do what we want with recycling, with, with incineration, with solar. The hell with their mandates, okay? They're not right. So there's a ton of stuff You'll be copied. Plenty of emails. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank and, you. Um, just share with you the information provided in what you said was comic book version. Um, just saying, I'm personally very appreciative of the information because it's a lot of information in just a few pages. Um, and yeah, uh, without going back and forth, um, appreciate the comments, and I think. Uh, the gist of it is in line with what we're going to accomplish this morning. So, next. Terry Smack. I thought you were in Las Vegas. I flew back just for this meeting. You did not. <laughs> I saw more pictures of Katie taking all this. So I was doing nothing, okay? Saying, I was doing nothing. Straight, I was man. relaxing. Zip lining and, nope, I'm not even going to go there. You're not there. supposed to be talking about my personal stuff here. I'm not. This is about a meeting about solar, <laughs> so I'm going to get to the point. I was impressed. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, I'm Teresa Smack, uh, also known as Terry Smack, and I live at 3775 Aaron Jacob Drive, which backs up to Route 194 and Brown Road. So we're surrounded basically all by agricultural. Behind us is going the, I think it's called 2000 or 4000 Brown LLC that is buried behind many, 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 many layers of businesses, by the way, in case you haven't looked. Um, I did send every one of you an email. Most of you have responded to me. I really appreciate it. Most of all, I appreciate the moratorium. Um, for you, um, all, I didn't grow up in Carroll County, but I've been a Carroll County resident for over 40 years. So this is my home. Um, and I appreciate, again, uh, Commissioner Kyler for all your words about uh, putting the moratorium in. I'm a little disturbed, though, that um, we were not notified by about the first meeting that was held November the 28th because we were within one mile of the town limits and we are supposed to be notified. Um, I'm worried that we didn't get, and when I left that meeting, I was told we would be notified of any other meetings that come up. I wasn't notified about this meeting either. So I'm on your radar now and I plan to stay on your radar <laughs> and I'm not jumping off. So just remember that, Ed. Um, and I know that you're very passionate, very passionate about the military, the firemen, the police. I too, they protect our lives. You know, 9-11 plays in my head. I wasn't there, but God, thank every single one of them that did protect us. I would love for each of you to protect us like those people did on 9-11. I would like you to put your resources to work they belong on commercial buildings or in commercial properties. Farmland backs up to me. And I moved there. Jack and I bought this beautiful piece of property. Some of you have visited me and Jack uh, on one or two occasions. You know where we live. We have a little piece of paradise. And I don't want to see that ruined. I got 20 more years probably to live on this earth. Don't ruin it for me. Um, 
I would love to know that you're going to worry about us as much as you're going to worry about the environmental benefits for the public safety training facility. Um, I worry about those solar panels breaking. My daughter, my youngest daughter, graduated last year from Columbia University, prestigious Columbia University, with a diploma on climate change. I asked her, would she live in our house? If it was given to her with that field behind her, she said no. <laughs> would you live, would you live with those panels in the ground behind your house? Yes or no? I don't think that you would. So I'm pleading and I will continue to plead and I will continue to stay on your radar to keep this moratorium going. Thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations on your 20 years. Thank you. It's and and uh, <laughs> just I do want to comment though because you mentioned resources, our resources, our resources are you, are your resources. Some of the gentlemen mentioned taxes. It's, it's not us, it's you. So that's why this is so important, I think, to all five of us up here. So, but thank you. Go ahead. Ms. Don Moyer. My name is Inez Don Moyer. I'm at 2803 Deer Park Road in Finksburg. Happy New Year, gentlemen. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So I am speaking, the, we're the Nora Valley, which is, I actually live right by the reservoir. I border the reservoir. And to have a solar project in our area it directly impacts my home and neighbors as well as the local wildlife. There are a lot of unknown risks from the runoff. Earlier in this meeting, you guys spoke about the PFAS and the toxic components that are coming up. We really do not know what's going to happen with the runoff from these, sol from these solars, with the stuff in the ground, with the panels themselves. And many of my neighbors and myself, we're on wells. It also feeds a stream, it feeds the reservoir, and I don't, know how you all feel but I believe water is life we are composed of 60 percent water ourselves so uh, it's very very important that we have potable water that will help feed the ag you know feed the wildlife and ourselves additionally um, with it flowing into neighboring properties culverts streams wells and the reservoir it will potentially cause a decline in our property value and a negative impact, as I mentioned, on the wildlife, which is comprised of the nesting, feeding of deer, hawks, fox, bald eagles, possums. I have chickens. I have a little homestead. I have chickens. I have horses, um, dogs, and little adorable pygmy goats. Uh, and the, the thought of having this so close to my home impacting my water source, my neighbors here, water source, and my little cute parkour playing goats negatively is very disturbing to me. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there are unknown health risks. Even with, they'd mentioned, we'd gone to some solar meetings and they talk about berms and buffering and planting these um, like uh, trees that e or shrubs that will eventually grow. Some of these things aren't even going to reach mature height for 10 years. So as they're growing, we still have to see these things, you know, that do not belong in a farming community. Um, I moved from California. We all have our opinions on California, where I was in Carroll County, uh, not Carroll County, sorry, Orange County, so Anaheim. I moved here in 95 to get away from that to embrace the fact that we do have farms because farms matter, agricultural matters. As someone mentioned earlier, what happens when these things get decommissioned? What's gonna happen there? Or if the business, uh, the solar community or whoever they sell it to goes out of business, what if we need that land back to farm? Because we all see what's going on with the food, the avian flu, the uh, food things getting, uh, um, catching fire mysteriously. Um, anyway, I know my time is up, but so thank you Appreciate for your time. It. Thank you for the moratorium, and uh, thank you. Thank you to the community. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> before we 
you have others, right? But before we go on, I apologize, Mr. Hayden. Afterwards, you want to talk PFAS. I did. I neglected to bring that up as far as public comment. So after this, come back and talk PFAS. Um, okay, but let's finish uh, this topic. So, Mark Wayland. Good morning or afternoon, maybe. I haven't looked at my clock. Uh, my name is Mark Whalen. I'm at 2710 Deer Park Road. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. I, I had to refrain myself from jumping up and down when I heard the, uh, <laughs> the moratorium. That was music to my ears. Uh, I think it's the right thing. You know, pumping the brakes on this is, is clearly the, the correct answer. There are a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we all uh, love our, our homes, our neighbors, the community, and we really need to work hard together collectively to, to preserve that. And I can say for myself and for my neighbors, and, and I'm sure everyone in this room, that I'm committed to work with you guys to, to work through this process and come up with a, a logical, reasonable solution to this. And, but, but I applaud you for your efforts for reconsidering this, uh, this, this solar uh, projects in these uh, agricultural communities. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheryl Bossy. Hi there, everyone. Good morning or afternoon. Morning. Still haven't checked the time. Um, Cheryl Bossy, 4148 Nora Drive. I, my property borders the Nora Valley uh, proposed solar field. Mm -hmm. um, we have about five acres, and the entire north side would neighbor that solar field if it is installed. I'd like to begin by reading the definition of agriculture. The science of practice or practice of farming, including cultivation of the soil, for the growing of crops or the rearing of animals to provide food, wool, and other products. And I believe that this text amendment is allowing Carroll County to change the definition of agriculture. And it, it's not right. It's not um, for the benefit of the residents here. It's for the benefit of the solar companies, perhaps the county. Um, and I realize that it's coming as a mandate from the federal government, but I do believe there are better locations for these solar projects than the huge <laughs> impact that it will have on its residents. Um, we've lived on our property for 32 years. We built our home there because of the adjoining field and the reservoir. Um, it is disheartening to me every day as I walk out to my horse pasture and take care of my horse, um, knowing that that is what we might have to be looking at the rest of our lives. My grandchildren now come to visit us. We are outside every day. We enjoy the outdoors. Um, this solar field will definitely change the quality of our lives and not for the better. Um, it, you know, I can be redundant here with what everyone else has said, but the impact on our property value is a huge concern. Obviously, the views and changing our quality of life in that way, but I feel like there are so many organizations here to benefit, and the residents are the ones that are going to take the brunt of it all. Um, we are not benefiting in any way. So I'll just continue with my time to read a few notes. Changing this view from industrial, uh, from agriculture to industrial um, just changes our lives forever. And I almost cried when you talked about the moratorium, and I thought at that point it had been passed, but I'll cry when it do finally does get passed. <laughs> uh, the runoff, you know, we already have runoff issues onto our property from this field, so that's a concern into the stream that fe feeds the reservoir all of the wildlife. Um, this field itself is a refuge for wildlife. So the, the impact on the surrounding ecosystem. And furthermore, in this text amendment, as you do address it, please consider that there is no landscape definition in this text amendment. It does say it needs to be screened 24-7. What does that mean? We need to have a classification. We don't want to see it if it does move forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Weishier.
Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kimberly Wishar. I live at 6569 Jasana Court in Sykesville. What I had planned to say, uh, I have put to the side and I'm not going to say, obviously because of the introduction of the moratorium. I would like a few clarification points, if you don't mind. If um, I am involved in the, I am directly affected by the proposal for Fannie Dorsey Road. And because that is so far along on the process, I would like to know how the uh, time involved for the passing of the moratorium affects that as the TRC meeting is set for next week prior yeah. to your agenda meeting. Yeah, so and and, and that, that's, that is a valid question mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a discussion, you know, and, and concern of ours in moving forward with those five properties um, and putting the moratorium in place, having it put in for six months and the effects. But I think Chris, you're probably best suited knowing that that property has gone through the TRC. It's at, about actually, to. It's about, about, to. about, about to. to. Yes. Okay, so it's about to. So what would a, a normal timeline be? Sure. So um, the TRC, the Technical Review Committee meeting, is very early on in the process. So essentially a developer submits a plan, a concept plan of what they would like to do. That goes to all the technical um, agencies for a review. And this is that first opportunity for those technical agencies to discuss with the developer what they're proposing and what kind of technical issues they will have to address through the process. So my recommendation would be that process would continue while the moratorium is being, um, the process is ongoing, correct, right? So, the, but the, uh, the next step then is that all of the technical comments need to be addressed and then it has to go to planning commission for a concept review. That process is a many, many month process. Um, we have some projects that have gone through TRC back in September, October timeframe, and they still have not completed addressing all the technical comments to go through Planning Commission. So if the concern is, is that all of a sudden this project will come to fruition while you're discussing the moratorium, that will not occur. There are, there's a lot of process ahead. It could be better than a year, even if the moratorium did not go into effect before this project will become a reality. So that should give you a bit of relief Yes, it does. Um, I do want to add uh, Commissioner Kyler and Commissioner Vigliotti specifically, uh, your comments and your verbiage literally created a lump in my throat and brought tears to my eyes because your feelings are so, so similar to mine. Um, my parents did move here 50 years ago. I was fortunate that they did that um, for the rural aesthetics and we actually moved back to the area for those rural aesthetics and everything involved in Carroll County and what it is and that rural county perspective. And we hope to be able to continue that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what you got there is Commissioner Vigliotti with five, six syllable words and Commissioner Kyler with one and two <laughs> syllable words, both saying the same thing, which is pretty impressive. Annette, okay. Annette Fleischel. I'm littler than most of the people that talk in this thing, so I'm standing on my tippy toes. Um, <laughs> my name is Annette Fleischel. I live at uh, 1401 Fanny Dorsey Road. I am directly across the street from Spring Valley Solar proposed facility that went to the TRC meeting in May of this year. I have been out of my mind, busy talking to people, doing everything to make what just happened happen. I am so, I'm so happy. I know I'm gonna just crack up trying to talk to you about it. Um, it is what I've been frantically working for for these past eight months. I bet everybody in this room knows my name. I bet all of you know my name. I have talked to Kirsten um, via email. I can't tell you how many times. I think the last time was about maybe two weeks ago. Um, and she did tell me that because it's been eight months, for me not to be concerned because this, uh, this solar energy company that's working with, the, with our project has not met all the requirements yet for the zoning, planning and zoning meeting. That is, my, that is my goal to not ever get to. So I trust that not just the moratorium is gonna happen, but some longevity is gonna be given. 
I bet I'm the number one project on it. So I am so, so happy. Uh, that's the first thing, and I want to thank all of you for doing it. I also want to tell you that I had a really good speech, but you took <laughs> all the wind out of my sails. That was the intent. Because it was all about what you didn't do the first time and what you need to do the second time. So I'm really happy about that, and I'm glad you clarified uh, about the moratorium. That's, that's really... Um, the, um, the property that I live on is 50 acres, so 20 of it is already um, uh, farmed by a local farmer. So I'm into farming. I've been in the Farm Bureau for 40 years. My kids grew up in agriculture. We know all about it. So um, what I want to do is say I'm really happy. I'm just going to hold on to these 140 petitions that I have from residents up and down Fannie Dorsey Road, and I hope I don't have to use them at my next, at my next meeting. I also want to tell you that two of the main things that I was going to discuss was transparency and did you do your due di diligence. So you just took about uh, two minutes out of, my, out of my speech if I tell you those two things. I do want to read just the very last um, part of my, my talk um, because that impacts directly on what just happened. The last thing I said was, I believe that the newly elected board of county commissioners has the responsibility to listen to the residents and communities in their respective districts and the authority to make change when it is deemed necessary. The last, the last statement was, I respectfully request this current board to propose a halt to these solar developments. I believe that together we can make change happen. Thank you. Absolutely, now and I that. Cry. Thank you. Well, <laughs> and that 140 names on that petition are all heard. So, <laughs> probably because they've been proposed before. <laughs> Virginia Brewer. Hello, I'm Virginia Brewer, and I live at 6407 Susquehanna Court, which is slightly offset from the Fannie Dorsey Road project, um, pr less than a quarter of a mile from there. Um, and I, most of what I had to say has already been said, so I'll just be brief. I do not believe that a solar farm, it should not be called a farm, and Chaberton was very um, blatant in saying, well, we're harvesting the power of the sun, and so that qualifies it as a farm. It is not a farm, it is industry, it is glass, metal, pipes and wires, and it should not be on agricultural or residential land. The Fannie Dorsey Road project is bordered on three sides by homes. The fourth side is going s proposed to be put in conservancy. However, it is a watershed for Piney Run, which then feeds to Piney Run Park Lake. One thing that has not been mentioned here is that the community that we live in, the name of it is Streamwood. And the name Streamwood is because there is a huge water table under all of those houses that are just off Fanny Torsey Road. And if this farm is allowed to be put there, there would be a lot of water runoff that would run right into our wells and to our septic systems. Um, those are the main things that I had to say. I am so opposed to it. I've done some research on um, property values and nationwide. There's nothing in Carroll County, but nationwide property values decrease anywhere from 5 to 25 percent if you live within one mile of a solar facility. Hmm. And notice I'm not calling it a farm. It's not a farm. Um, it, they should not be in residential communities. They should be in industrial communities, commercially um, properties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And last but not least, uh, Caroline Lowe. I'm Caroline Lowe. I reside at 900 Hoods Mill Road in Woodbine. And my project is on Hoods Mill. It's on the Shoemaker Farm. Um, it is a leftover piece of ag land, zoned ag. 
Uh, I am on a fourth generation farm. My 11 year old will be the fifth generation. When I first found out about this, uh, my husband actually farms the little piece of land um, that we're talking about. And he saw the surveying and I called the county. And, uh, and that's where I found out uh, that solar is proposed. Um, I then feverishly started emailing my previous uh, District 4 commissioner, who after several emails told me, move. So, um, so I have been in a huge battle. I have researched solar uh, like crazy. And uh, I'm becoming very knowledgeable, and uh, and I can be your new best friend. <laughs> so I just wanted to introduce. I wasn't going to speak, but I want to introduce myself because I'll be communicating with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have any others, uh, Chris? Do we have any on the phone? Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Washar. Could you unmute yourself by hitting star six? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're ready. Go ahead and begin. Very good. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have prepared comments and I'd like to go through them. Um, my name is Gary Wishar. My home is located on Jasana Court in Sykesville, where my property borders a proposed industrial farm. This proposed industrial solar farm is bordered by residential homes on three sides. I am vehemently opposed to this project, as well as other industrial solar projects proposed in Carroll County. The words industrial versus residential are polar opposites. Neither belongs next to each other. I attended a town hall meeting hosted by Commissioner Rothstein on Tuesday. To quote Commissioner Rothstein, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Okay, good. <laughs> if something is wrong, we need to fix it. He stated that he spoke to his fellow commissioners on community industrial farms, and he said that four of the five commissioners were concerned about placing these types of projects in residential communities. When I asked him who the sole center was, he would not identify that commissioner. My home, along with numerous other homes, would be exposed to these unsightly solar panels and the chain link fence surrounding the fields. The property owners and developer proposed dense landscaping to buffer the panels and fence. However, the developer said that within 10 years, based on evergreen tree growth, the field would not be visible. However, that's at the grade level. What about homes that have a second floor? For my home, from the second floor, we will always be looking at unsightly solar panels because the proposed buffer will never cover the panels and fencing. In fact, one of my neighbors will have a chain link fence approximately 260 feet from his front door. 10 years, commissioners. Market value of my home is my retirement. By putting this horrendous proposal in my backyard and other Carroll County residents will diminish my property value, thereby placing an undue board burden on me to work longer on Tuesday. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. If it's wrong, let's fix it. Fellow commissioners, I ask you to envision a chain link fence bordering your property line and inside that border, seeing industrial solar panels and ask yourself one question. Would you like to see this every single day? I believe your answers would be a resounding hell no. I am not opposed to solar, but the commissioners have the opportunity to change where these industrial solar panels can be placed. Contrary to a response I received from Commissioner Rothstein, where he stated that the PSC has the authority over solar growth to meet a state mandated energy requirement, former Governor Hogan stated solar projects are regulated via the county planning, zoning, and permitting processes. I surmise this is means that this is a county matter, not a state matter. I challenge you as commissioners to listen to the strong opposition you continue to receive on these industrial solar projects in neighborhoods from your constituents and initiate a moratorium 
and not feel compelled to hold yourself to the six-month moratorium that is proposed, similar to our bordering counties on these eyesores in our communities, residential neighborhoods, and pursue alternative sites to mount these solar panels. They don't belong in our backyards. We started this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioners, pledge your allegiance to Carroll County, where these industrial solar farms will strongly erode the character and the beauty of Carroll County, and why all of us are, were originally attracted to Carroll County to raise our families. Commissioners, have the courage and the fortitude to say no to residential industrial solar farms. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chris, do we have anyone else? No, sir, that was our only caller for this item. Tim, did you have something you want to share? Just one unsolicited comment, since we have a room full of people. I, I want to remind you that <clears throat> a new legislative session has just opened in, in Annapolis, and it's no secret that uh, the uh, development of solar and uh, alternative uh, energy sources is a goal of, of many down in Annapolis. So make sure you're paying very close attention to them as well, because what they do may obviate this whole thing so you need to pay close attention to that as well thank you yeah i i appreciate that and just like here your voice matters you know sometimes it's us carrying the water um but your voice matters we have a legislation that represents us down there uh in annapolis um albeit a uh in the minority as you've all heard and know uh it doesn't stop us and should never stop us from speaking up when we know something should be done or not done. So, um, okay, before I go any further, Jack, uh, you want to talk PFAS, please. Thank you, and uh, I guess I have to recant. I uh, appreciate the time you guys are giving us to speak and I want to be seen as a valuable resource, not just an angry citizen, uh, which I guess everybody here is. A little, a little bit of both. <laughs> a little bit of both, right. <laughs> and I'd like to compliment this gentleman in one minute. He said such a great response. It did a great job. Um, I, I want to be seen as a resource, um, and um, I, I'm a public servant, okay? <clears throat> For you guys that know me, I'm in my 44th year of picking up trash, and I pick up from 30,000 homes in Baltimore County for 44 years. I've never missed a pickup. And of course, we're in the commercial, industrial, landfill, and all that. Um, and so these laws have unintended consequences. The PFAS thing is one. Um, the um, the, the, the thing about the Northeast Authority is another one. They have unintended consequences that you really have to drill down on. And those of us that get stuck with them later, like they had good consequences when they passed this tax, but now we're dealing with it now. This PFAS stuff came out for good reasons. Now it's damaging, and landfills are a big issue with it. Electric batteries and equipment are a huge problem right now mm -hmm. for landfills. They catch on fire. You run over it with a truck, it, it bursts into flames. Mm -hmm. We're having fires all the time. These are unintended consequences of all this technology, which solar is one of them, that we have to be very careful about. This thing about water runoff is critical. These, these we're, we're on wells, you know? We're like cavemen up there. We don't even have, we don't even have internet yet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we appreciate your time. And I want to be a resource to you because I know a lot about all this stuff. And I'll be love to share with you, and I will, with all these issues. Absolutely, and really do appreciate um, if you get the opportunity to share with us uh, via email. Um, yeah, I will. On the other topic, because as you heard from Mr. Fowler, that is a topic of interest. Um, down in Annapolis so and to get us for the more. record your household has now had about nine minutes okay well, <laughs> thank you <Kenny. laughs> okay. and you know just like the federal government's jamming all this down I have somebody mandating me also I, I get up there and show a little you know <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Terry. <laughs> okay thank you no other comments Chris no other comments any other comments from the floor we have a motion and 
I think, four seconds. Um, seeing here, no other discussion. All in favor of moving forward with the work that Mr. Burke has to do in providing us a moratorium by next week, or at least a language, and steps forward. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. So those that are interested, if uh, you'd like to stay for the installation of pole lighting at the Carroll County Farm Museum, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> if not, I'm gonna give it a few seconds or a minute. And thank you very much. Depart. Yes, thank you very much. And I expect Ms. Taylor, you just took notes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I have lots of questions later. They pulled the rug out. Oh sure you God. do. That's what they did on the large farm, solar farm. Cares in class. You can't regulate them, so that's, keep an eye on them. They're running loose. <laughs> Mrs. Taylor, you scare me because you didn't speak, but you took notes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's just give it another uh, few seconds. Thank you again. Ben. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. You know where to find us. <laughs> I know it. Okay. Let's talk about the installation of pole lighting at the Carroll County Farm Museum. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> the Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Building Construction requests your approval for the installation of pole lighting at the Carroll County Farm Museum in the total amount of. Um, $199,522.20 to Eastern Sales and Engineering Company Incorporated. This purchase is being made through a Charles County contract that was competitively bid. This amount is within the approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Good morning, Commissioners. Actually, it's good afternoon <laughs> uh, in light of your previous agenda item. We'll try to be brief and succinct. Um, joining me this morning is Eric Burdine, our Deputy Director, Department of Public Works, Mr. Dave Valentine, Project Manager for this project. As Kim stated, Bureau of Building Construction is before you this morning to request your approval to award a contract to Eastern Sales and Engineering Company, Inc. in the amount of 199522.20 for work to be, formed, to be performed at the Carroll County Farm Museum. The project will consist of the removal of 14 compromised wood poles and fixtures, including in the project are three additional poles and fixtures and will be installed to provide adequate parking lot lighting. New wiring is also a part of the work and will be required to support the lights pole receptacles and to meet current electrical codes. We have prepared a brief PowerPoint presentation to show the condition and location of said poles. As Kim also stated, the project was competitively bid, is within our budget, and no additional funds are requested or required. Thank me again. Thank you for your, your time this afternoon, and we welcome any questions which you may have. So th this is a piggyback of something that was competitively bid in another county? Correct. Okay. Any other uh, questions? I mean, it's always, you know, especially uh, sticker shock uh, early on. Um, $200,000 for 14 poles and a bunch of lights is a lot of money. Um, it's actually going to end up, Commissioner, to be 17 poles. Okay. We're adding, basically when you pull into the main parking lot of the farm museum, the blacktop parking lot, that area was identified as not being secure and not having enough light for evening hours. So the row, uh, row, the row of poles that's currently there, we're stepping those back and adding three more poles right up against the blacktop parking lot to illuminate that whole parking lot that currently has no light. So that'll make it safer for 
the evening hours and all the wedding parties it's part of a bigger project we're actually going to also illuminate the walkway to the wedding barn mm -hmm. that's coming up these are all safety concerns that it got brought up um as the pictures in the powerpoint <clears throat> show the lights are falling down some of them are flipped up towards the sky right. that when the wind blows it just spins them so this is all we're adding more heads you'll see in the pictures there are basically whatever was laying around got put up some of these lights are old street lights that were probably donated um the other ones are just dust to dawn lights so there's not adequate light so we're going to actually the poles that are coming out you're going to add more light to the pole plus we're adding more poles to make it safer and more secure so the two words i really don't like to talk about are change orders and with everything you just shared are there expectations of change orders being put in place for three additional poles from 14 to 17 yeah. or lights on the walks this property was already walked through with the contractors we've okay. already identified the pro you know the actual source of yeah. power where yep. the power will be distributed um there's always that <coughs> could be you know if, if i had that magical power to see beneath the dirt and all of a sudden there's something there that yeah. nobody knew was there there is always that possibility mm -hmm. but we've exhausted every option we can to go over this piece of property and make sure we have what everybody needs and diligently tried to put it all in this are there any supply material supply issues what do you think the timing will be of this it depends on the day <laughs> one day you'll call and they'll tell you the poles are the problem the next day these bases are going to be preformed concrete bases so they won't be poured on site they're already pre-made they're looking the average right now pretty much for any pole light is anywhere from 10 to 30 weeks these lights the last time i checked were anywhere from 10 to 15 weeks okay any other uh comments questions late poles and trucks that's what we purchase <laughs> Um, I move the Board of Commissioners award the installation of lighting at the Carroll County Farm Museum to Eastern Sales and Engineering Company in the amount of 199 Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very thank much. You thank you, Commissioners, for your time. Absolutely. You. Let's talk about an F-250. Twenty twenty two F two fifty. Oh, okay. The Office of Procurement in cooperation with Fleet Management requests your approval to purchase one 2022 F-250 from Hagerstown Ford in the amount of $48,068. This amount is within the approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Afternoon. So we are requesting the purchase of an F-250 or in place this 2006 Jeep Liberty. Uh, the reason for the transition from the small SUV to a pickup truck is because the vehicle is used by a supervisor position within the Bureau of Roads. As we discussed last week, that position is responsible for, for transporting staff, tools and materials to and from job sites and performing inspections. For obvious reasons, the small SUV is not a preferred vehicle for those tasks. Um, the pickup truck will also be able to accommodate a front snow plow. So it's another vehicle that we will have in our fleet to help perform snow removal and other winter weather cleanup. The vehicle is in stock at Hagerstown Ford. It's available for immediate purchase and with the board's approval, we would expect it within a week. Oh, well, there's a cause for celebration. Wow. <laughs> yes, <it is>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Motion to award the purchase of one Ford F-250 in the total amount of $48,068 from Hagerstown Ford. Second. Got a motion, got a second. Any discussion? Seen here. None. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hit the easy button. 
Thanks, Nick. Okay, let's talk about the FY24 annual transportation plan. Ladies. Good afternoon, Commissioners. And if you remember in the committee meeting, I didn't promise you you'd be in here at 9 a.m. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and how's the married life? It's it's married. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I have no complaints. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> All right. So, morning, or it's not morning, afternoon. Um, again, I am officially now Stacy Graham. Um, Nash still works, though. I still prefer it, but here we are. So, um, I am the Transportation Grants Manager in the Department of Public Works. Um, I'm here this morning, this afternoon, <laughs> regarding the annual transportation grant, but I wanted to give you a semi-quick overview of transit um, before I get into the grant application, if that is okay with you guys. <clears throat> so, Carroll Transit System, or CTS, is comprised of two transit modes, demand response, which is door-to-door -door service, and the trailblazers, which are the blue buses on the fixed routes. Both services are available to anyone in the county and are countywide, um, but only within Carroll County. We don't go outside of the county boundary on either of these services. The services are funded by a mixture of FTA and MTA funding, local dollars, and bus fares. Um, I'll have a breakdown of that once we get into the grant application. I also wanted to include our veteran shuttle, um, even though that is not public transportation, and this is the only time I'm going to reference it today because it has nothing to do with the funding. Um, it's still an awesome transit op uh, option for our Carroll County veterans. The shuttle is available at no cost to any veteran in Carroll County to take them to a VA appointment. Our main destinations are the Baltimore VA, the Martinsburg VA, and Fort Detrick, although other destinations can be approved through Citizen Services. The veteran shuttle is 100% funded by county dollars, so we have more freedom with the vehicles and the service itself, unlike public transportation where we have to follow all the federal guidelines. Um, all three of these services, Veteran Demand Response and Trailblazers, are contracted out. Our current vendor is Ride With Us. The contract is in its third year and has two one-year options left before it will be put, put back out to bid um, with the next contract starting in FY26. Our demand response system is the shared ride door to door. That means anyone can call and reserve a ride, um, even up to the same day, depending on availability. All the rider needs to do is call CTS and give the dispatcher some pertinent information, who, where, when. Um, and the dispatcher will provide a 30 minute window for a pickup. That was 15 minutes before their pickup time to 15 minutes after to account for traffic or lift delays or any of that when they're picking up other people. Um, the rider just has to be ready when the bus gets there. So the fares are based on mileage. As you can see, they range from $4 to $9 one way, with the exception of seniors going to their nearest senior center. That is a $2 trip. Um, or dialysis clients coming into Westminster that are outside of the, outside of the town um, being $5. Stacey, exact I apologize. Yeah. Just the contract is with Shared Ride. The con the the contract is with Ride With Us. Is with Ride With Us. I'm looking to share Ride. Is Ride With Us. And it is a three-year contract with... Two one-year options. With two one-year options. And Correct. we are in option are, one. No, we are in... Right now, we are in three. So option one is going to start in okay, July. Okay, so we're still within the meat of the contract. Yes. Okay. Um, is it going to come before we go into the option? Will it be competed? Uh, with no, others, as part of the RFP, it was written to be a three-year with two-year op two option years. Right. Um, so we can continue through that. It's just an option if there were problems that we can easily kind of go right. in a different direction. Yeah, but I mean, uh, we yeah, have every intention to continue with the vendor right now. Understood. But that option that that's up to us on how we want to spend. Yes. You know, if there's if there are other vendors out there to compete knowing that this is an option, then they can come to us, correct? H how is that done? We would have to go back out to RFP to have right. um, other vendors bid, um, but we were not intending to. <laughs> we I mean, we could, um, uh, And just from, a, cause from my background mm -hmm. with government contracting, when you go into an option year, you then have the potential of competing with other, you know, vendors or other, you know, uh, folks that are out there. Um, 
I, I'm just curious how that. And, and I, I'm curious, do you think the option's advantageous to Carroll County and maybe now isn't a good time to go out on the market? How do you feel? So, I mean, I think, the that, terms? I think that we have a very good relationship with the vendor now. I know that was not the case prior, um, but I think that our relationship is very good and things have really straightened out and are running really well. I don't know that it would be a, I mean, it's never a great time to write to get a new vendor, but um, yeah. since things are running so smoothly, I don't know that I would necessarily put it out to bid for an option year. I think that um, we would, we could. How but long, how long in, have you um, had the vendor? They have been the vendor. They had the previous contract when cats went out of business. So seven years. Um, but when we went back out to bid, they were our only bidder. Um, so there weren't other people interested at that time. Okay, I'm, I'm just, yeah, just curious, asking the question how we deal with option years. Um, I mean, generally we go forward as long as we're satisfied with the performance of the of the contractor. Right. Okay. Um, and um, you know the options give us flexibility, but if um, things are going well, then um, yeah. we usually wait until the yeah. options are expired yeah. and then do the bid process. That's yeah. generally speaking the way we handle it. Yeah, and and uh, there, I'm, you know. I don't want to sound like I'm against anything. I'm just right. more asking the question how we deal with option years. Yeah, that's so. generally the case. Okay. okay. Thank you, Roberta. <laughs> um, all right, back to demand response. It's fares. Exact fare is required when you get on the bus. Um, no change is given. Fares can be paid by cash, bus ticket, or we now have the availability for a fare um, account where you can use a credit card and put money on it and spend it down as you ride. That only works for demand response, but um, it's a, a really good option for riders. We also have a no-show policy. If a rider does not show for their ride, there is a no-show fee of whatever the um, fare would have been. We only require a one-hour notice of cancellation. Um, it's a it's helpful to get that cancellation because if there is someone with same day with a oh, same day request and we had initially told them no and now we can put them on, we will. Um, as opposed to going and not picking up anybody. So that is why that um, no-show fee is there. And we currently run the demand response service with 27 vehicles, ranging from five passenger minivans to our largest buses being the 12 passenger and two wheelchairs. All right, the Trailblazers are our fixed routes. We have three in Westminster, two in North Carroll, and one in Tawny Town. The Trailblazers are open to the public and run on fixed routes with set stops. The fare is $2 each time the rider boards the bus, unless they are an older adult, individual with a disability, or a Medicare card holder, in which case it is a dollar, 50% off. Um, fares, just like demand response, are paid by cash or tickets, and there is no change given on the bus. Tailblazers can also deviate up to three quarters of a mile from a stop. So for an extra dollar, they can call up to three hours ahead and let us know to deviate from that stop to pick them up from their house if that is within three quarters of a mile from the stop. Um, the most recent change to our Trailblazer was the discontinuation of the South Carroll route due to low ridership. That was ended um, the end of December of 2022. And before that, the last major update went into effect January 2021, um, which reduced almost all of our routes to a 30 minute wait time. Before they were kind of all over the place and you never really had an easy way to follow. Um, now you know if your bus gets there at 8.04, it's going to get there every half an hour there, there forward, which is easy to follow. Um, this is a very, very simple map, um, but these are the colors, and you can see that they all converge at workforce development right here across the street, so that if you are riding from the orange route, you can transfer to the purple route and get into Westminster um, at, from work, workforce development. The black route is one of our Westminster routes. This is the one with the highest ridership. Um, it is the only route currently that has two buses running 30 minutes apart. So that's how we got that 30 minute wait time with two buses running the exact same route. Um, this is mainly a you know, residential to shopping. I think that's why it's the most highly used. People can get picked up and go get groceries, head on home. Um, but it's always been the best utilized and um, easiest to maneuver and all of that. The purple route, also in Westminster, is more of a medical and the Carroll Community um, College side. 
This one is set up to have a second bus. So right now it's on an hour loop, but when we made all those changes in 21, we had a second bus. Um, and then COVID was, you know, telling us that we didn't really need to have two buses running around um, with no one on it. So we had suspended the second one. If we still have the option, if ridership really jumps, we can be able to put that second route right back on the road and get people back to a half an hour. The orange route is in North Carroll. This one also has two buses, but they're not the same route. Um, so one stays in the Hampstead area and is on a 30 minute loop. The other one, um, connects with that first route at the North Carroll Senior Center and allows for transferring between those two to be able to come into Westminster um, and transfer at workforce development. And this one was implemented in FY19 and has had really, I mean, in comparison to that route, not great ridership, but has been, had great ridership in comparison to being a new route. People were really excited about it and it was clearly a, a needed route, um, which is nice when we do something and people use it and it works out. <laughs> Um, last but not least is the green route. This one comes from Tawny Town into Westminster. It doesn't have a second route to do that, so the loop is a full hour. Um, but this one has always had great ridership also. People have really, um, have really liked coming in to Westminster since there's not much going on in Tawny Town as far as medical and that kind of stuff. Um, all of our routes are looked at on an annual basis so that we can look at ridership by stop to see whether stops need to be removed or added. We also look at demand response for common locations. If there is something that a lot of people are going to and it's not on a route and should be, we would consider adding that. Um, and overall ridership to determine whether the route needs to be canceled like South Carroll or if there's a lot of people in one area that need a new route. That's how we got in Hampstead, Manchester. Um, this is our ridership details. Ridership took a pretty significant hit during COVID like all transit systems did. Um, so while looking at this comparison, uh, FY20 looks great, but um, those last, that last quarter, we really didn't have a lot happening with transit. So it's really only nine months worth of numbers. Um, but on that note, our trailblazers have definitely made the better comeback and they are so close to being um, Pre-COVID numbers, our black route is over pre-COVID number, which is even better. It means it's doing better than it was before. Um, so demand response is about halfway. Um, I think that's a, a mixture of COVID, obviously, and people not really wanting to get back out yet, but also the changes to our DDA community and not going into the centers and telehealth and some other options that have, have happened now that they don't need the service. So it is increasing, it is slowly coming back um, and increasing every year, which is what we want it to do. Can I ask, and I apologize for of interrupting, uh, the numbers here, these are, are these unique riders or are these the number of? Uh, They're the number of trips. Number of trips? Thanks. Yeah, so it could be theoretically 36 of the exact same person taking the same trip, but um, that is not the case. <laughs> I was just, I'm curious, and if you go into this later in the presentation, you can tell me to, to be quiet, but do you have an idea for the total number of unique riders for the entire? system um and if not that's okay I, I, i'm not I, I don't have it with me okay. um and i would not be able to tell you that for trailblazers because we do not track who gets on the bus for trailblazers um i mean our drivers know a lot of our people so they could probably give you an idea um but as far as tracking that i, I have no idea for demand response we can um, we can certainly track who is on the bus and how many times they ride so i would be able to give that to you for demand response i'm just kind of curious about it but thank mm -hmm. you very much yeah. Um, all right, a couple more notes. We offer a college student discount for both Carroll and McDaniel students for 50% off fares, so demand response and Trailblazer. Um, we also, on the Trailblazer, offer free deviations to our libraries in North Carroll, Tawny Town, and Westminster. Um, we had been going to the libraries, and the one in Westminster isn't super safe to stop in front of, so it's just easier to deviate if they want to go. They don't need to call ahead, just get on the bus and tell, you that, tell them that's where they want to head to. CTS follows all county government holidays and our weather decisions. We have a Transit Advisory Council set up. Our chair, Jenny, is here today. Um, and they advise on some things that we can try to do for the community, and most importantly, they were set up for the advisement of the transportation development plan which has to happen every five years in accordance with our grant application 
Um, we had just started holding safety meetings at CTS. So for the for on the first Wednesday of each quarter between 11 and 1, service stops, and we talk about safety. We talk about near misses and accidents and anything that we think we can change to make the service safer. Um, we ran a Saturday pilot in the summer, fall um, of last year from August to October. It was a good pilot to do. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people that had asked for Saturday service, so we thought the ridership would be higher. It was not, so we did not continue with that service once the pilot was over. And just to add it to your calendars, March 18th is Transit Appreciation Driver Day. Um, that is a Saturday this year, so you won't see them, but um, we will celebrate all week and try and get our drivers some appreciation. So is there any question on the service? <laughs> Mine is I get more into. procedural, and uh, I'm, I'm running out of time to flip the on the new person card. So this is a request for a public hearing. Then what's the process following that? What happens? How? I think Stacy will tell, walk you. Th I will get will through that next. Through that. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is very prescribed by the federal government, so it's it's very different than our normal public hearing process. Uh, I, yeah. I've got a quick question, but uh, this is the first time I've seen this briefing. Very nicely put together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and so the southernmost stop on the purple route is what what's the name of the southernmost stop yeah on the so purple we're probably getting route. into we're probably getting Carol down hospital? to Eldersburg at that point where carroll hospital would be the southern that's the southernmost one okay. i would i think i was way off all right um and it's, it's um, really centered in westminster and then it goes to carroll and then kind of comes back up okay and uh not if you had any obviously we're not we're not bringing trailblazer to the Mount Airy area, but if I would, I would be curious if you had any statistics on the demand response trips from either from Mount Airy, Taylorsville, and like the Woodbine area. If you have an opportunity to provide those to me at some point, I'd I'd love to see them. I can certainly get them to you. I don't have them in no, front of fine. me. No, no, fine. Um, that's fine. I mean, we do we do um, transport people from that area. Um, I'm just and, curious. And we look at it every year when we're looking at Trailblazers to see if because we've talked about it since that is an area of the county that doesn't have um a a trailblazer option right now but every time we've looked at it, it hasn't needed that but we do transport people and i will definitely get you those numbers thank you all right any other service related questions okay <laughs> okay main purpose is to get your approval to advertise for the opportunity to request a public hearing <laughs> This is part of our annual transportation plan, or ATP, which is the um, annual grant application for our formula funding. The first part, it's in two parts, is due to MTA February 3rd and includes all of this operations detail that I kind of just went through with you. Um, so while this is a preliminary budget, it's only for use in the public hearing, um, I will come back to you in March to get the final approval for the budget. <clears throat> Um, our grant application requires us to offer the opportunity for a public hearing, and should anyone request one, we'll hold it here in session on February 23rd. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, 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 yeah, public transit is funded with a mix of FTA and MTA funding, as well as county funding and fair revenue. And as you can see in the preliminary budget, there is an increase between 23 and 24 of expenses of about 600,000. The biggest um, contributors to that are the increase to the hourly rate and the increase of ridership. More riders, since it's a um, rate per revenue hour, the more people that are on the bus, the more we pay the contractor. Um, but I want to focus on the revenue streams. So we have been awarded in the last couple years due to COVID over $5 million of COVID relief funding. So between CARES and ARPA and CRISA, um, which if you want to know what they stand for, I'm gonna refer to Corey because I don't remember. Um, <laughs> so in FY22, we had decided to use all CARES money. Um, we didn't ask for any federal funding. We didn't use any county dollars. We used all CARES. And then MTA kind of looked at us sideways and they were like, oh, might want to take your formula funding just in case. Okay, great. So in FY23, we took our formula funding and that requires our county match and then use the rest of our CARES to cover the rest of the operating budget. And we are proposing to do the same thing again this year, 
take the standard um, formula funding with the $300,000 in county match and use our remaining COVID funding to cover any other operating expenses. So MTA, FTA, MTA um, has been flat as long as I've been here, which is almost five years from what I understand before that hasn't changed at all. But now MTA is looking at a new allocation method and uh, it's still very up in the air as to what our allocation could be. Um, we've had some meetings and some webinars and they can't really give us a definitive because they're gonna base it off of an array of different things but it's gonna look at a whole state. So our ridership and our miles and our hours compared to everybody else. So it's gonna change every year. It's gonna be depending on what other counties are doing and what we're doing and all of that. So it won't be as easy to budget for as this flat has been. Um, but it, we are expecting that we should be getting more money, which is exciting, but then the county match is gonna go up um, to go along with that more money. So, in the interest of not having any idea what that's going to look like for FY24, we thought since we still had plenty of CARES money left, or COVID funding, it's not just CARES, um, we would stick with the flat funding again for this year, and the $300,000 in county match, and then use the rest of CARES. All right, on the second page of your briefing paper is the capital budget. I just noticed when I was um, doing, doing this presentation that it says FY23 preliminary, that is Typo, FY24 is, is correct, so I'm very sorry for that. Um, but in the capital budget, we are requesting four replacement vehicles. We requested four last year and they awarded us three. That seems to be the pattern um, from when I've been here. So I'm gonna stick with my four and hope for the best, but three is great. Um, and these vehicles take just as long to come in as all the ones that Reed has told you take forever. Not They're not down the street and we can't just go pick them up. So um, they're taking a while to come in. We're also going to request 10 tablets, replacement tablets. They are used in the buses for the drivers for dispatching and routing and picking up and counting passengers. And then we're also requesting some transit um, facility improvements, which includes security cameras and badge access to the doors. Um, in addition to all that, our standard preventative maintenance is what we request every year, this $200,000 more and more important every year because buses are getting older and they're getting harder to get. It's taking longer to get them. So we are spending a slightly bit more money keeping the buses up and running that we currently have. So we can wait until the new ones come in. So if all of those things are approved through M MTA, FTA, um, the county match would be just over $65,000. But that's only if they approve them. If they only give us three vehicles and none of the improvements, then it would be less than that. So that's the most that the county would be spending on capital. With all of that said, <laughs> this is, um, the budget is still part of the second part of the application. So what we're going to be putting out for the opportunity to request a public hearing is the highest amount that we're gonna request from the federal government in grant fundings. So that's what the public hearing would be about is about requesting the funds of, of the grant. So it's the only thing I'm here is just for <laughs> the opportunity to request a public hearing. So they would, in writing or email or call or whatever, request it and then we would hold it. And if no one requests it, you will not see me on the 23rd. You typic, uh, does typically someone request one or just varies? Rarely, rarely you rarely. have. Rarely, yeah. I can't think of a time. There might, maybe you can, Stacy. I can't think of a time when anyone not for this yeah not for this i mean this is all about the money so i don't think that anyone's going to come in and say no don't request that from the state that's now, silly if commissioner rothstein could bring it up in east town hall you might get 15 or 20 people. Uh, kidding. <laughs> maybe <laughs> nope <clears throat> so yeah i mean so you can't you're scheduled to come back the public hearing if it's requested would be february 23rd right because okay. we will put it in yeah. the paper um, this week or Monday at the latest because there's a set timeline of how long it needs to be run and how long out and how long they can request it all of those good federal requirements all very prescribed <laughs> okay so we need a motion to go direct you to go into public or to advertise correct for okay. the opportunity 
to advertise to go into public hearing. No, just no. read the motion. Just that. What's that? I suggest you just read it because it's very Where good. Where is it? <laughs> I, I can make the motion go if you ahead. want me to. All right. <laughs> motion to direct staff to advertise the option to request a public hearing using the preliminary funding request for the FY24 annual transportation plan. Second. Okay, got a motion and second. I didn't look at that <clears throat> slide. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank, Thank you. you right. wow. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Okay. Let us talk about supermajority ordinance. Um, Chris, is there anyone on the line regarding this? No, sir. Okay. It's actually a supermajority resolution. Supermajority yes. resolution. What did I say? Ordinance resolution. The agenda should say resolution. It does. It does. There was a typo though in the beginning. Oh, it, sentence, okay. So. It said ordinance here. Got it. It's resolution. We do have a typo though. It's 2011, not 2022, the 59th board. <sighs> say again. Uh, opening sentence. It states in 2022, the 59th board. The it 61st. should say. It should. Well. Oh. No, it should be the if it's the 59th for the original. It should be 2011, because it was adopted. Yeah. Correct. So it was in 2011, the 59th board. Correct. Got it. Okay, so I guess for the good of community, let me just read this, you know, and then we can just go from there. In 2011, the 59th Board of County Commissioners adopted resolution 815 TAC 2011, which provides that the county, that the commissioners cannot increase the tax rate for real or per personal property, admissions and amusements hotels 911 or income unless the increase is approved by at least four of the members of the board commissioner gordon has requested the adoption of the attached resolution <clears throat> which would require a vote of at least four commissioners to repeal resolution 815 tech 2011 so I guess I Commissioner know. Gordon. I'll make the um, motion if you want. Or you want to talk about? Well, I got a question first. Sure. The, the, your logic is, let's say I wanted to raise taxes, um, and I only got three votes, so I can't. But I could Correct. get rid of the rule with Correct. three votes. We're closing a loophole. So Correct. We're closing logic. a loophole. That's that's what we're doing essentially. Um, you know, you you could argue it's a super super majority. I, or I guess we could call it, but. Uh, we're, we're just closing out the loophole that would make it easier. So if you had three that wanted to take that option, you wouldn't need the four, which, you know, for the last however many boards has been the the operating procedure that we would need four to do so. Gotcha. So we're just basically strengthening that that little detail and closing that loophole. I, I do not have a copy of the resolution in Tim's my... Tim's getting it. It was... Oh, okay. They, they, there was a... They should have okay. given it to us to put in the books, <clears> and they didn't. Well, that said, though, I like the idea. You know, that it's a safeguard to the safeguard as I had previously. Well, you know, it could be any board. It could be a board 20 years from now. Right. And if they want to make that call, that's up to them at that point. Now, we don't need four votes today, right? <laughs> I need five. <laughs> well, and, and, that's, and, and that becomes the, you know, issue is you don't need four votes to adopt this resolution, but the resolution is like you said a safeguard the yes. four votes to not you know repeal the yeah resolution i mean it does become a you know a infinite regressive yeah yeah yes what you said yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just believe what you said i'm not sure what you said but i believe it um so I it, joe <laughs> yeah i think um we're gonna be you know, I guess open for discussion at this point, um, because they're going to come with a resolution. I won't say I'm agnostic to it. I think if uh, we have an ability to safeguard 
you know, and, and strengthen things we do, why wouldn't we? Um, you know, I don't want to make it so difficult to change things, but if we believe that this can strengthen our, you know, how we look at dealing with um, taxes and, you know, tax rates, I mean, or, the, or actually at the supermajority. Is this the only supermajority rule we have? That I, yes, I believe so. There's no other supermajority to do anything else? Not that I've ever heard okay. of. Okay. Maybe we can create some. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, solar sighting. No. no. Too soon. Um, okay. <clears throat> so while we're patiently waiting, um, Commissioner Gordon, you want to have comments on this or? Um, I mean, primarily, like I said, it's just to close this loophole. Um, and it's interesting because in the past I've heard different commentary from some. Some have said it's not actually a resolution, even though clearly the document states it is and it was passed in 2011. So to me, it's just, you know, it's closing the loophole. As I said previously, it's, you know, it's strengthening the prior resolution by the 59th board, and it just adds another layer of protection uh, for the people in the community. So, I mean, in all sincerity, is anybody worried about that infinite regress or the repeal of, uh, you know, this resolution to undo the other resolution regarding the supermajority? Because if we're looking for a potential way to close that gap, do we say that you need a supermajority to repeal this resolution right. to repeal the other? I think you're good at this point. Why? No, you'd need at least you'd you. need at least a supermajority. <laughs> I, I mean, that that's the only, yeah. you know, question is how far out does it go? Um, and it's not necessarily a loophole; it's more um, of a way to strengthen a serious, you know, resolute, not a, a serious action that the Board of County Commissioners can take. I mean, that's really what, you know, you're, you're strengthening the, the concerns, um, but. Well, if anything, it, it sends a message that I, I personally would like to send. So I'm in favor of it. Which is what? The supermajority for the. Supermajority. And, and uh, no, I like what's the, wording, the What's the message? Um, the message is that we are a fiscally conservative county and that we take the fact that we would, could be raising taxes seriously and we fully take into account the impact it's going to have on people's lives and businesses and the people around us. That's, that's for me, that's what it means. Okay. Because I, I, I agree with that. I think we are fiscally conservative. We um, haven't adjusted taxes in 10 years except for lowering them, and I think we've shown that from last few boards or at least the last board I was on and uh, the ones before that um, that the last action with taxes was actually lowering taxes um, so yeah I think that's the the message um, that I think is very valuable um, <clears throat> the and, and I'm I'll tell you right now I'm I'm not against this uh, you know I just my, my only concern is, is limiting government's, um, not powers, but uh, interference, um, lessening the redundancy, lessening the duplication, letting people just do their thing. But if, you know, this is just another add-on to something that we're already doing. Um, I'm okay with that, but I just, uh, I try, to, I try to figure out, okay, how can I do less, you know, from a government's perspective, you know, when it comes to these rules. Um, but if the intent is to do exactly what you're saying, I'm, I'm okay with it. So. Yeah, and, and I agree that, that you, you never want to add to government if you can help it. But I like paragraph four, and that's the message I think everybody wants to send. The, the Board of County Commissioner wishes to strengthen the taxpayers' right. protection. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think at the same time, and looking at this from, from, you know, our standpoint, 
this increases the level of responsibility we have to be fiscally sound in our policy making and our decision making. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> skipped ahead. We had a little bit of discussion uh, prior to any motions. Is there a motion? I move the Board of County Commissioners adopt the resolution requiring a vote of four commissioners to repeal resolution 815 2011. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion, although we had a whole lot already? Any further discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Cool. Okay. Um, let's see. Chris, anyone on the line for public comment? Yes, sir. Okay, what I need is uh, a review of the January 12th land acquisition uh, closed minutes, closed minutes from January 12th regarding land acquisition. Apologize. <clears throat> Okay, is there any <coughs> comments? I, I guess it's this? redundant to ask the county attorney if what he filled out is legal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if redundant is the right word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <coughs> if we're good with the minutes from our closed meeting on January 12th regarding land acquisition, I need a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Second. I got a motion second. Is there any further discussion regarding this? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Open admin. Does anyone have anything for open admin at this time? Okay, prior to going into uh, closed for land acquisition, why don't you come on up and let's talk about agendas. <clears throat> Whew. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a full day so far. Yeah. Okay, Monday, January 23rd, we have nothing scheduled. Tuesday, January 24th, the uh, point in time or pit count will be occurring. Uh, we're going to meet over at uh, Citizen Services at 8.30 uh, that morning. Um, Commissioner Kyler and I will be participating in that. I'll be participating in that oh, too. Oh, are you? Okay. Cool. Wednesday, January 25th. Um, it's a, it's going to be a little bit changed. It's actually Commissioner Kyler will be participating in the MAKO's Education Subcommittee at 930. And I will be participating, I believe, in the Tax Subcommittee at 930, if you get the details from uh, Vivian. At um, 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, Commissioner Vigliotti will be uh, participating in the Aging Meeting Luncheon over at Westminster Senior Center Multipurpose Room. At 3.30 p.m., Commissioner Kyler and I will be attending, not virtual, but attending, the MAKO Legislative Committee meeting. And then afterwards, at 5 p.m., attending the MAKO Legislative Reception, uh, down both down in Annapolis. On Thursday, we start our open session at 10 a.m. and let's see approving lease space for the offender diversion unit for the sheriff's office with Sheriff DeWeese 
uh, there'll be a legislative update from Mr. Fowler, economic development and land use study from uh, Ms. Eisenberg, and, um, and the team over at uh, planning and get an update on what they've been doing with uh, the Want Wantman group. Uh, briefing request to go to public hearing for rezoning case number 228, Eldersburg Investors uh, LLC. Ms. Eisenberg will be presenting approval for FY24 grant application and award acceptance on a rural legacy program. Present the state recertification report from land resource management, oh, okay. Purchase of staff uniforms and dress uniforms for the Department of Fire and EMS. It's becoming real as they're getting clothed. At 1 p.m., the uh, Environmental Advisory Council annual joint meeting and proposed 2023 work plan will be conducted in the Reagan Room uh, down in 003, where we will all be in attendance. Friday, nothing scheduled. Saturday, nothing scheduled. Sunday, January 29th, Commissioner Gordon has a luxury of the podcast. On Monday, January 30th, wow, the end of January, uh, nothing scheduled. Tuesday, January 31st, is the CCHD meet and greet lunch, where all five of us will be attending. Um, Wednesday, February 1st, MAKO Legislative Committee, uh, where Commissioner Kyler and I will be uh, participating virtually. Um, same at 9.30, and then we go into Legislative Committee. At 6 p.m., Commissioner Gordon will be participating in the Planning and Zoning Commission, which will be virtual. At 6 p.m., the Board of Education FY24 Operating Budget Hearing and Board Work Session. Have we identified who would like to uh, attend that? Last As time we spoke about it, no one was interested. So if that's changed, great. If not, what's that? Last time we spoke about it, no one was interested in attending. But if that's changed, let us know. If not, okay, we'll we got till, you know, it's February first. We'll we'll see if somebody. I may be, but let's, as a tentative right now, I gotta check other things. Not it. I did the last one. So. <laughs> uh, Thursday. We go into open at 10 a.m. Rezoning case number 229, the Hutton Street 21 LLC. And then request approval to accept money, which is always nice, from 911 board, Ms. Hawkins uh, will be presenting. Request approval to purchase a five-year renewal contract to priority dispatch, Ms. Hawkins. Oh, this is gonna be her morning. And request approval to accept funding from the Maryland 911 board request approval. Yeah. So we got we're there are two different issues. We're accepting money, then we're getting funding. Okay. We're accepting money. We're spending it. We're accepting money, and then we're spending it. Okay. <laughs> um, Easy to say. Yeah. Very <laughs> request good. approval to make a purchase. It is. It's like yeah. Okay. From Carousel Industries using a combination of 911 board. Homeland Security Grant and Operating Budget Funds. Keeping us all straight on that will be Ms. Hawkins. Taste of Maryland will be at uh, Maryland Live that evening at 6.30, I'll be attending. It's, um, where all the, I think, ag boards and farm bureaus come together uh, across the state, is what I'm told. Uh, so I'm going as part of the ag board. Friday, nothing scheduled, neither on Saturday, and Commissioner Guerin has the podcast on Sunday, February 5th. And it goes without saying that some items will be added to the agenda relating to the moratorium Absolutely. And, the, yes. and that stuff yes. as, as, yep. 
as appropriate. Absolutely. I appreciate that because there was obviously a lot of energy spent this morning, yeah. but those will be added uh, appropriately. One, actually two quick things. Um, jumping back, first and foremost, Ms. Hill, happy birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Wow. Thank you. And, sec birthday. and secondly, um, let's see here. On the, uh, the 26th, I realize we're in session that morning, but I'm going to be attending the Hexagon Grand Opening that morning at 9.30. At 9.30? Yes, sir. Okay. That's a cool acquiring. That's, that's awesome. So um, to, I think that's going to be a great gain for Carroll County. Um, okay, is there anything else? Anything else on schedules? Okay. What I need is, I think, motion to go into closed, right? For land, for land acquisition. acquisition. Make a motion I was to go into there. closed for land acquisition. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now, motion to adjourn after closed. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.